stuck in the 20th century are badly flawed and are creating havoc in the radio marketplace. From the outset, the data provided under the PPM system evidenced erratic rating swings for which there is no plausible explanation other than the quality and reliability of the sample. For example, Univision's Los Angeles-based KLVE saw its ratings plummet 54 percent from first quarter 2008 to first, first quarter 2009. As Arbitron introduced the PPM system into over 30 markets nationwide, it submitted the system to the Media Ratings Council for accreditation. To date, the MRC, the independent industry body established by Congress to oversee media rating services, has failed to credit the PPM in all but two markets. The MRC's decision to withhold accreditation is not arbitrary. While MRC proceedings are confidential, the PPM system's flaws have been well documented in public sources and can be assumed to factor heavily in the MRC's accreditation decisions. First, Arbitron recruits from the wrong sample frame. Arbitron's primary sample frame includes only households with landline telephone numbers. Households with no telephones and cell phone only households are excluded from the main sample frame. Minorities are present in these excluded categories as a, at a much higher rate than other groups. Second, Arbitron includes cell phone only ho households via a separate sample with very low response rates that is controlled to contribute 10 to 15 percent of the households in each market. But cell phone only households are disproportionately young and minority. 25% of Hispanics live in cell phone only households, as do 21.4% of African Americans and 41.5% of those aged 25 to 29. And of course, the number of cell phone only households continues to grow month after month. Third, African American and Hispanic listeners are underrepresented in the sample panels. Arbitron has proved unable to meet its own internal metrics for minority participation in its sample panels. Even when there are enough, they are not representative. Fourth, Arbitron panels are too small. For example, in Atlanta, each African American panelist is assumed to represent 10,000 others. Fifth, PPM panelists do not receive the training or support they need to use the devices properly. Every single one of these issues is entirely fixable. All that is required for Arbitron is for Arbitron to apply the same commitment that it has shown to the, using 21st century ratings technology to implement 21st century research methodology. That means recognizing that in the 21st century, wireless America, an address-based sample is preferable to a landline-based sample. It means recognizing that in 21st century diverse America, in-person recruiting, a bigger, more representative sample, and robust participant training are not luxuries. They are necessities. Creating the kind of 21st century methodology is entirely possible. We know these things are possible because Arbitron has already done them in Houston. In Houston, Arbitron made the needed investment in an address-based sample frame and in-person recruitment, and as a result, the PPM system was given MRC accreditation. What's good enough for Houston should be good enough for the rest of America. Arbitron must reaffirm its genuine commitment to the MRC process, not simply going through the motions of the audit. Arbitron should agree that it will not make new rating systems currency in markets until the MRC has accredited them. Accredited them. Meanwhile, Arbitron should agree to maintain the previous diary-based system in parallel to the new electronic system until MRC provides accreditation. Maintaining the diary system service is the only alternative that allows buyers and sellers to have usable measurements during the time it takes Arbitron to address the flaws in the PPM service. These changes must be made in haste. Every day that passes, the ability of minority broadcasters 
to continue meeting the needs of our communities is threatened. The time for action is now. Mr. Chairman, I appreciate the opportunity to share these views with you today, and I would be pleased to answer any questions you or members of the committee may have. Thank you very much for your testimony. Mr. Honig. Chairman Towns, Ranking Member Issa, and members of the committee, my name is David Honig. I am the President and Executive Director of the Minority Media and Telecommunications Council, MMTC. MMTC is a member of the PPM Coalition, which consists of the Spanish Radio Association, Univision Communications, Inc., Spanish Broadcasting System, Entrevision Communications Corporation, the National Association of Black-Owned Broadcasters, ICBC Broadcast Holdings, Border Media Partners, the Association of Hispanic Advertising Agencies, KJLH Los Angeles, and, of course, MMTC. I appreciate this opportunity to address the committee as it considers the effects of Arbitron's PPM on diversity in radio broadcasting. The Supreme Court has noted that it has long been a basic tenet of national communications policy that the widest dissemination of information from diverse and antagonistic sources is essential to the welfare of the public. Diversity means acknowledging, understanding, accepting, valuing, and celebrating differences among people with respect to age, class, ethnicity, gender, and race. True diversity in broadcast ownership will result in more diverse speech, more choices for listeners, and more owners who are responsive to their local communities and serve the public interest. Adequate representation of minority viewpoints in programming serves not only the needs and interests of the minority community, but also enriches and educates the non-minority audience. It enhances the diversified programming, which is a key objective of the Communications Act and the First Amendment. For example, two studies have clearly demonstrated that minority-oriented media produce a positive and measurable impact on the communities they serve. A 2005 study found that black targeted newspapers and radio stations function as mobilizing channels for political participation among black voters. Controlling for the size of the black population in the market, the availability of black targeted media had an elevating effect on black voter participation. And a 2006 study determined that voter turnout among Hispanic voters was five to 10 percentage points higher in areas with Spanish language local news than in areas without that service. Thus, communication services to diverse audiences benefit our democracy as a whole in our continuing quest for opportunity and equality. The U.S. Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit has recognized that public policy places primary reliance with respect to diversification of content on media ownership, which has historically proven to be significantly influential with respect to editorial comment and the presentation of the news. This has proven to be true in recent months, as minority audiences has been, have been undercounted by the PPM rating services. All commercial broadcasters depend on advertising for their livelihood, and audience ratings are the sole method of determining the size of audiences that are available to listen to radio advertising messages. In the top 50 markets, Ar Arbitron is the monopoly provider of radio audience measurement services. When minority audiences are undercounted, advertising dollars shrink or disappear altogether for those minority targeted stations. The simplest solution for a standard profit-driven broadcaster would be to switch to a mainstream cookie cutter format to program for the ratings. It has been the minority owned broadcasters who have valiantly held to the task of serving their local minority communities with targeted formats. But true dedication alone will not pay the electric bill and make payroll. Without sure and quick relief, even the minority-owned stations will struggle to survive. And every time any one of these extraordinary radio voices fails, the fabric of our society becomes a bit more tattered. The obvious solution is for Arbitron to repair its broken methodology and provide the accurate survey data that the broadcasting and advertising industries have a right to expect. If Arbitron is not providing a product that meets legitimate expectations for accuracy and reliability, then the company should not be in a position to bind minority targeted radio stations to grossly expensive contracts for years in the future. At the very least, these broadcasters should have the freedom to explore other options and seek a more responsible audience measurement service that cares about its mission. In the absence of this minimal level of relief, the committee should encourage the Federal Communications Commission to exercise its authority under Section 403 of the Communications Act and institute a full inquiry into Arbitron's practices and their impact on diversity and public welfare. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much. And before we start our questioning, I would like to recognize, I see in the audience, um, Commissioner Clyburn of the FCC. Thank you so much for uh, coming as well, that, uh, Commissioner Clyburn. Thank you. Um, let me um, uh, move to ask, let me just begin with you, um, Mr. Skarzynski. In a letter to this committee in October, Arbitron represented that it is committed to the Media Rating Council uh, accreditation process. Do you agree that the MRC standards and its codes of conduct ensure fair, accurate, and reliable rating data? You consider them as being, is it fair, reliable rating data? Mr. <coughs> Mr. Chairman, Arbitron is committed to the MRC process, and we believe that the MRC process does yield the result that, you, that you've just described. Well, then, if that's the case, why is it that you've only been approved in, 30, in two out of the 33? I mean, if that's the case. I mean, why would you continue to roll out if you really respect that process and feel that it's important? I mean, why would you continue to do that? Mr. Chairman, Arbitron follows the rules of the MRC process. The MRC process does not require that a audience measurement service provider obtain accreditation prior to commercialization. The process for, to obtain accreditation can take many, many years. And this is the industry practice that audience measurement service providers, in, not only in radio, but in television, internet, cable TV, print, while seeking, while striving to get accreditation, can commercialize uh, a, a market and a, and a service. So we're following the rules. The important step before commercialization is that an audit is conducted, as Mr. Ivey has described, by a third party. In the case of, of Arbitron, Ernst & Young is the third party auditor <clears throat> excuse me, who audits our markets prior to commercialization. And the audit process is a very lengthy, uh, thorough, and uh, detailed process. And I, <clears throat> pardon me, and I can assure you, Mr. Chairman, that as CEO of Arbitron, if there was a showstopper that came up in the, con in the context of the audit, that we would not commercialize uh, a, a market. So we're following the rules. Accreditation can take many, many years. You have to, you have to shorten Nielsen, your answers because you don't have Nielsen, your answers in, its, in its TV audience measurement, had, uh, launched that electronic measurement, started in 2002, and they have obtained probably 10 or 11 accredited, accredited markets at this point in time and are still seeking accreditation. So this is the industry practice. But Mrs. Garzinski, though, I mean, let's face it. Now, we're talking about... 33 markets, and you only have approval in two. I mean, I could see maybe one or two over, and then you're still working on it. But, I mean, to me, that seems like you're just totally ignoring and just doing whatever you want to do. I mean, that's what, there's a clear indication here. Uh, let me just ask you, Mr. Ivey, uh, what are the main reasons that the MRC has not granted accreditation to Arbitron in these 31 um, markets? What are the reasons? Yes. Is that your question, Mr. Chairman? That's what we get question. Um, sure. Well, first of all, if I could just spend a second, because uh, Mr. Skarzynski raised a rather complex issue. Uh, it is true that uh, the MRC is not a government organization. We're, we have no authority, and we were not designed to prevent a commercial enterprise from rolling out a product. We don't have that type of authority. Um, However, we do have a voluntary code of conduct, and that voluntary code of conduct says that at minimum a rating service should have an audit before it commercializes a product and have that uh, exposed to our audit committee so that we can decide whether it should be accredited or not, because that's what the marketplace relies on. However, the voluntary code of conduct goes on to make other recommendations. The, other, the voluntary code of conduct says that we would prefer that a rating service doesn't implement a product 
until it's accredited. And we also say that we would prefer that a rating service doesn't discontinue an accredited service before they get accreditation of a new product. So those preferences are stated, but you should know that because of the way we're structured as an organization, we don't enforce that. And we've been reviewed by the Department of Justice and the FTC and, you know, when Nielsen, Mr. Skarzynski referenced Nielsen, they were rolling out products without getting accreditation. That led to two Senate hearings on the matter similar to this, where customers were saying, why is Nielsen rolling out these products? Why didn't the MRC accredit it? And Senate hearings happened. Um, so this causes controversy. That's why we have those recommendations in our voluntary code. But we cannot enforce that because we're not a government organization. And I'm not asking you to set that power to us, but I'm just trying to explain the facts, that we state our preferences. We believe very strongly that an audit needs to be conducted and a marketplace should know whether accreditation is granted or not for those 30 markets so that they can either rely on that or not. Many, many customers look to accreditation as kind of like the good, good housekeeping seal. And when that's not present, they know that it's not present for a reason. Uh, as, Mrs. as Ms. Shagrin said, we don't do that arbitrarily. So hope that clears it up. The, we, we have. We've made, numerous, we've made numerous recommendations to Arbitron. What, uh, was the, what was their response? Well, Arbitron has implemented numerous recommendations. We still have some on the table. We're kind of getting to a stage where some of these recommendations are very tough because this methodology requires, if you put yourself, Mr. Chairman, in the position of a panelist for PPM, you have to wear this PPM device. You not only have to wear it when you're here, but you have to wear it at home. You have to wear it when you wake up in the morning. You have to carry it with you when you go to the bathroom, when you take a shower. When you come home from work, you carry that methodology with you, the, the, the meter with you. Those are human conditions and human cooperation that are difficult to gather. So uh, we've made a lot of recommendations to Arbitron. We've got pages and pages of recommendations and letter. Arbitron has, has implemented many of those. Some of them have worked. Some of them have not worked. And some of the more expensive ones, like sending people out to train householders on a wider basis, in person, on how to use the meter, having in-person contact to explain to people why it's important, et cetera. Those are very costly. So Arbitron is trying to balance the cost implications and the improvement in implications in these services. And I can't speak for Arbitron in the matter, but I can tell you it's a very complex situation. We think we know a lot about what it takes to improve, and those recommendations are on the table. They're about in-person contact, more intense installation and training for the panelists, um, making sure that geographically the panel is representative, you know, there are a lot of issues that are on the table with us and Arbitron. And, you know, you guys have subpoenaed our records and you have a lot of that information. And some of them are very confidential. So I don't, I don't know whether we should, because of the trade aspects, whether we should go into those mm -hmm. in that much detail. I hope I answered your question. Right. Thank you. Mr. Skarzynski, why are you sort of resisting, you know, the suggestions and recommendations and instead of making the changes you just rather roll out? And, and I'm afraid that you're going to kill some of these radio stations, uh, you know, if you continue to do this and not respond. I mean, some of them will be gone, you know, by the time many of these things might even be dealt with at all. Mr. Chairman, we have a very active program to improve our service based on the recommendations that we have received from not only from our customers, but also from Mr. Ivey and the MRC staff. And we don't feel that the service is flawed. We feel actually that for nine markets, including the New York market, our performance in, in 2009 is very, very strong. And we feel we're performing at a level that deserves MRC accreditation. And I believe that we have supplied to the committee the actual reports that we submitted to the MRC last month to comment on our performance. And 
uh, to show the trends and, and to show where we are in particular markets, including New York. So we welcome the suggestions for improvements. We're making these improvements. Mr. Ivey commented on the training activities. We have a very, very extensive training program to bring in and orient a new, a new panelist. We have local market coaches who go out in, into the field and help with a panelist. As a matter of fact, two Saturdays ago, I spent uh, the afternoon with one of our local market coaches in Prince George's County here, here in Maryland and worked with the panelists, this, this particular household, uh, to uh, help them through the process. So we're, we're very, uh, very active in trying to get all of our panelists to participate at, at, at a performance level. And, and we feel, certainly in, in the case of New York and these nine markets, uh, eight, eight other markets, that we're performing at a level that uh, would earn us MRC accreditation. Let me say what my problem is. My problem is that I'm looking and I see that some of these recommendations were made two years ago. Two years ago. I'm also looking at the fact that there was one station in New York in particular that was rated number one. And now that station is number 15, you know, without moving any place, going any place, doing anything, you know. But the point is that, you know, uh, doesn't that bother you? Uh, but you know, you rather just continue to roll out. The the health and uh, prosperity and the fact of that our you have not, the fact that you have not moved to correct some of these recommendations over the past two years. I, I, with, with all due respect, Mr. Chairman, we have implemented the, many of these recommendations. We have a, a program of over uh, 60 initiatives that we have worked on and, and employed across all of our PPM markets. So I, I don't think it's correct to say that we are not making, we are not acting on these recommendations, that we're not making these improvements. I, w I would beg to differ, sir. Yeah. Yes, uh, Mr. Hunting, then I'm going to move along. Go ahead. Yes. Chairman, I'm a little disturbed by two. You, you, you. Mr. Chairman, I'm a little disturbed and disappointed by two things that Mr. Skarzynski has said that I think cut right to the heart of what this is about. One was that if there were some problem identified before going to currency that was a showstopper, the company would not go to currency. Let's look at what the problems was that was not enough to go to currency. 30, 40, 50, 60 percent declines in ratings for some stations. If there had been a new technology that had that impact on voter participation or on school segregation or on equal employment or on fair housing or environmental protection, that would be a showstopper by any standard. It would be a national scandal. Because this affects democracy so deeply, it is just as much of a scandal. The other thing that disturbed me was, and I appreciate the, the, the good intentions, um, that the company is going to begin to, de to develop an engagement index. The difficulty is that that's been a recommendation that we've been waiting for for three years, and it's not that difficult. And there just comes a time when you just can't rely alone on promises and have to begin to, to, to undertake some oversight based on past history. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Shagrin. And my time is, I think, expired. I think there's something wrong with this clock. I think I know I've been talking for more than five minutes. You know, it's okay. Uh, we like you know, what you're saying. Yeah. <laughs> I, I want to reinforce uh, what Mr. Honig said in terms of showstoppers. I think a major issue here is the fact that some of these problems, most of the problems that we are seeing today, we saw in the early audits in the, in the early mar in the markets that were originally rolled out. And we brought those both as individual customers and through the MRC to Arbitron and saying, you have some basic problems, we have some basic concerns. Had they stopped then and addressed those, we probably wouldn't have 33 markets out there that have ideas. 
The problem today is that now there are 33 that need fixing or 31 that need fixing, and it gets much, much more difficult and more costly. There is some way and some stoppage. Time to. Um Ms. Chu. Yes. Thank you. Gentlewoman from California. Ms. Thank you, Mr. Chu. Chair. Uh, Mr. Skarzynski, um, according to the PPM Coalition, Arbitron's flawed methodology in the PPM has been an issue for the past 60 years. In the meantime, minority radio stations are experiencing a, a precipitous drop in their ratings and a corresponding loss in advertising revenues. I've learned that um, uh, companies like Univision, whose main market is a Spanish-speaking population, has decided to opt out of the PPM measurement system uh, because it no longer makes business sense and uh, as a result, there is no other measurement options. And there are other drastic situations, such as a 70% decline in radio station ratings for, for certain stations, and one station going from a ranking of 1 to 21. And in fact, that station no longer exists on the airwaves. This seems to me like a very drastic situation, and it's been going on for at least six years. And yet, from what I hear from you, it seems like you you see this as no problem. You see the situation as not a problem. And so I want to know, does your, do you even think of this as a problem? And if so, then is your company taking any steps to rectify the situation? Congresswoman, we began the rollout of PPM just a few years ago, not, not six years ago. The, uh, transition from the pen and paper diary, I'm holding up a, a copy of, of the diary, uh, to the electronic form of measurement was something that was desired by the radio industry. We worked with the radio industry to develop the PPM technology. The concerns of our customers are, are we're, we're very sensitive to the concerns of our customers. The issue of a loss in rating is not is, is something that it has occurred in the transition from the pen and paper diary to the PPM. It has affected many broadcasters, not simply urban or Hispanic broadcasters, because we learned from, in going from diary to PPM. Diary is based on a recall factor. I, I fill out this diary once a week and I try to recall, perhaps I do it at the end of the week, what, did I, what stations did I listen to? In the diary, and I have a chart that uh, captures listening. I don't know if, if it's possible to put this on the screen. The PPM captures listening exposure chart. But in, in this example, the, uh, for a, a a black male, I don't know if we can get the chart on the screen, a black male uh, filled out the diary and, w and filled out the diary and said, here are the two radio stations that I listen to. And when one year later when the PPM service was, and I listened to these two stations and I listened to them for eight hours a day. Once the PPM uh, audience measurement service had been, had been inst is established, it was found that this, this, and here's the chart on the right, that instead of listening, of course this listener did listen to those two stations, but actually listened to four or five other stations and didn't listen to radio eight hours a day. So what we do is measure exposure to radio and the fact that in the diary, there, the radio, because of the great loyalty of radio listeners, the diary keeper was saying, I listen to just these two. In fact, you see a very different result. And uh, that is a, tr a true measure of ex what, what is uh, the listener is, how, how the listener is exposed to radio as opposed to just a recall factor. And I think this is a important uh, point to make that it has affected a variety of different broadcasters, 
and a, a variety of different formats, talk radio, Christian radio, Hispanic radio, urban radio. The talk radio host, Sean Hannity, had a 60% decline when we moved from diary to PPM, and it was in this experience that while there, what, there, were, there is a loyal base of listeners, the, the listeners were doing more than listening just to Sean Hannity. And, and the, in the exposure to radio that you get in PPM, you see that there is a greater selection, a greater number of, of radio stations that a listener is, is, is covering, and that they're actually not listening to radio eight, eight hours a day. So I presume you're saying there is no problem. We don't believe that our methodology or our technology has flaws. We think that we have a solid methodology and a solid technology. And we think that even as you look at the performance of panelists by different demographics, that the performance of panelists, or urban and his African American and Hispanic panelists, is at the same level in our, in our panel as, as those of, of any other demographic. Actually, though, um, I do see one big problem, which uh, has to do with um, uh, the lack of Spanish-speaking participants in your PPM ratings panels. In fact, I have a very large Hispanic population in my district in California, and I think this is a very serious deficit. What efforts have you been made, have you made to ensure that there is more uh, Spanish-speaking participants so that there is a more accurate rating? <clears throat> Congresswoman, we take great care in standing up a panel that matches the demographics of the market. We use, we start with the census data that are updated every year by a firm called Claritas. And every year in the month of October, we're updating the panel to reflect any changes in the demographics. So that is to say, for a given market, we would have as many male, percentage-wise, as many males and females as there are in, in the census data updated annually by Claritas, as many white, African-American, and Hispanic listeners, as, as percentage-wise, as there are in the market. And then we look at it in several age groups. 6 to 17, 18 to 34, 35 to 44, 45 to 55, 55 and older. We, we take very careful, uh, we, we do our work very, very carefully to select a panel that is representative of the market that we're serving. And in terms of recruitment of Hispanic panelists or pros prospective Hispanic panelists, and this was a, uh, a improvement recommendation that actually came from our customers and also from the MRC, we're recruiting the panelists, a, a Hispanic panelist prospect, we're recruiting them uh, with a Spanish speaker. I yield, I yield the late additional one minute so Mr. Ivey and, uh, uh, can respond. Give the gentlewoman an additional minute, yes. If possible, Scott, um, I referred in my oral testimony to some charts that were attached to our, our written testimony, and Scott uh, made some copies of some of them to put on an overhead. And Your mic on? Your mic on? We haven't trouble so. hearing you. It looks like it's on. Exhibit F, if you uh, pull up Atlanta, which is uh, the first market, um, and I know the chart is small, but uh, basically, I w you, people have been talking about specifics. What specifically are the issues? And I, this is an illustration of one issue. Um, this shows young panelists, panelists that are 18 to 34-year-olds in Atlanta, and how they cooperated with the PPM device over time. So on the average day, how many young panelists carried and, were, and had their data accepted by Arbitron for processing in the ratings. So um, as you see in January, that number was, a, was around 70 for the red line, which is females, 
and a little above 70 for the blue line, which was males. And those rates, we, we look at and we say, okay, well, those are nearing reasonableness. Keep in mind that that means 30% almost of the people don't carry their PPM or don't, don't have their data processed. But one of the things that we've noticed during 2009, that rate went down. You can see the decline in that chart. And Scott, if you would put up the next market in alphabetical order, which is Boston, you'd see that, that those numbers declined. And, and by September, those were at 65, which means 35% of the panelists of that age group don't carry their PPM on the, don't comply with that methodology on the average day. So, and then so on. Uh, Scott could put up Chicago, the next chart. You take a look at the trend in Chicago. And then uh, further into the packet is New York. In deference to you, Chairman, from New York, you could look at New York. And you'll see that the trend at the end of New York is not going down. It's going up. Important point. Arbitron took some action and put in more procedures to, to interact with panelists in New York during that time frame where those numbers are going up, more in-person interaction, we believe. And those are parts of the recommendations that the MRC is trying to push Arbitron to make. They didn't make that improvement yet in the other markets. I attached Exhibit G to the testimony and they started to make some of those improvements in October. So, Scott, if you put up Atlanta for October in Exhibit G, remember that chart was all the way down by September. You see that now the end of that chart is going up, so more panelists are beginning to comply. This is a very complex issue. We're trying to improve the performance of this service, and Arbitron is trying to cooperate, and they're implementing some of our recommendations, and some of them they're looking at, and they're saying, well, they're too expensive, whatever, and they're trying to make improvements. The MRC is not going to credit this methodology until issues like this reach a level that we believe, with a collective voting of the MRC membership, are appropriate. We don't have written standards for what that is, because every Meter technology is different and the diary is different, but issues like this, and this one's very visible. This is just males 18 to 34 and females 18 to the 34. There are other things that are more granular about the technology and things where we're in dialogue with Arbitron, but this is an illustration of a, a key issue. So you wanted specifics. This is very specific. You saw declines during 2009, which caused us pause when we're going to credit this service. How do we know what people do when they don't carry the PPM? What do they do? What do they listen to on the radio? Are they exposed to radio? Are they not? Are they exposed the same as when they do carry the PPM? Arbitron's even done some studies of that, but they're very small. So we're, we're wrestling with these issues. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now you have five minutes to... Uh, Mr. Chairman, could I make a comment, please, on, on what, Mr. Actually, charts? Let me just yield to the gentlewoman from um, uh, Washington, D.C. Uh, uh, thank minutes. you, Mr. Chairman, and I thank you for this hearing. Um, uh, because causality is always a, a difficult issue under the best of circumstances, uh, I take it the panel would agree that with the growth in um, people of color in our country, that radio should see a growth overall in listeners uh, from people of color. Could we agree on that? Yes, I would, Congresswoman. Um, Mr. Sh uh, Shosinski, I have to tell you I am no L Luddite. <laughs> And I understand what uh, you are trying to do. Indeed, I was impressed with the uh, series of graphs involving one man. I should have thought that anybody, by the way, getting back a diary that said they did anything eight hours a day uh, would have understood that that meant that they weren't doing that. Uh, continually. So I was, you know, I'm impressed by the difference and what you capture. I'd be much more impressed with seeing that captured 
with a, 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 a sample uh, rather than one man. Uh, I can pick out one man any day of the week and prove anything you would like. I understand what you are getting at, but until you show me a sample that shows that kind of pattern, I'm not sure I am convinced. Look, what's at issue here may be the life and death of one of the most viable uh, industries for people of color. So obviously there is going to be some concern in, in, the, in the Congress uh, about that, and the, particularly about these fluctuations. I am super sensitive to what's happening to every business of every kind in the United States today. The only um, entity uh, uh, able to write a check today uh, is the United States government, and that's because we don't have to have the money in the bank. So I understand that every industry is affected, um, and yet it would seem to me that there's an obligation on the part of the Congress to try to ask uh, the question that I ask uh, of, of you, Mr. Jarzinski. How can we, uh, um, can you say with any certainty that PPM uh, is not a significant ingredient in what is happening to um, stations, minority-owned stations, um, and that the, the rest of it must be something else like the recession. Can you say that with any certainty? Congressman, we do not believe that PPM is the root cause of on what is that belief grounded? On what is the, it based? The, the radio industry is suffering right now, as you noted, Congresswoman, with the general economy. There has been a decline in revenue for all Are broadcasters. Are you seeing these declines uh, equally uh, among stations that service uh, majority populations and minority populations. No difference whatsoever. There have been, in terms of revenue declines, there have been the same revenue declines percentage-wise for the general market as, as has been the case for Hispanic and Would urban broadcasters. Would you submit uh, whatever you are basing that on? You say the general market, that would include minority stations. I, I'm, I'm asking. Uh, stations that I can name, I, I can name some in, in the District of Columbia, for yes. that target uh, certain areas, which we know to be largely white, as opposed to stations which target uh, areas where the population is minority. Have you that kind of research on which you would base what you have just said to this committee? We do, Congresswoman. When I was referring to the general market, I was referring to, that's a term in the radio industry, Mean, general meaning not uh, stations that are targeted at an urban or Hispanic broadcaster. And I believe Mr. Liggins uh, of Radio One is going to speak in the next segment of the panel, and he can share with you the specific details. All right, let me, I've read Mr. Liggins' uh, testimony. I know him. I respect him. Indeed, Radio One is located in my district, and therefore I was very, very interested in his testimony. Of course, Mr. Mr. Liggins is, uh, sits at the helm of an empire, not simply a station, and I admire what he and Kathy Hughes have done, love them dearly. Uh, are you, in fact, telling this committee that all the other minority stations uh, have to do is to do what Radio One did, alter their programming, and they will increase their PPM M ratings. Is that your advice to stations not a part of an empire, uh, which may have been able more easily to make this change? Just do what Radio One did, and you fellas are going to be all right. Well, Congresswoman, we're not in the business of advising radio broadcasters what to do. And of course, the programming decisions are the decisions made by the uh, individual broadcaster. I cited in my oral testimony that Stevie Wonder Station, KJLH in the Los Angeles uh, area, looked at the, in, in this particular case, the programming director of that station 
looked at the PPM data, which is very granular data, and made a decision to switch over to the Steve Harvey uh, what would keep program. A what would keep a station from, from uh, simply incorporating uh, what you say these successful stations have done? What would, what would make a station not want to do that? I'm sorry, I didn't hear the what first part. What would keep a minority-owned station from doing what Radio One and the station you have just cited did? What keeps them from doing it, in your view? There, there would be no obstacle in, in having them make that change. Well, there's, uh, do you have an answer to that, Ms. I, Ms. I would love to answer that. Uh, I think what keeps us from doing that is if the, we thought that these were reliable and accurate estimates, then we would do what we do with other audience estimates and use it to make programming decisions. But given the inaccuracy of the sample and the fact that the sample, the people providing that information are not representative of Hispanics or of, or of African Americans, we cannot make programming decisions. When I started out in this business and I tried to explain to someone at an English language broadcast network that the differences he was seeing was because the universe was changing, he said to me, I don't care if it's right or wrong, I just want to program to the sample. We don't believe that at Univision. We believe that we have an obligation to the 15 million Spanish radio listeners to provide them with entertainment and with information they need. And we are not going to change our programming until we have samples that are representative of those, of those listeners, and then we can use that information to improve. We're not going to do it based on bad information. Mr. Honing, you had a response. I wanted to cut right to this question of causation. Mr. Skarzynski correctly recognizes that this is not the only problem, the only burden facing minority radio. Those stations also uh, are burdened by lack of access to capital, by weaker signals historically, by outdated engineering rules, by EEO non-enforcement, and by advertisers that won't consider advertising on them simply because of the race of members of the audience. Those problems have existed for years, and notwithstanding them, as horrible as they are, stations continue to perform well in those formats until they get disrupted by PPM. You see the numbers collapse in the markets where currency has been, under, has, has been uh, granted, and only in those markets over the last two years have the numbers collapsed. That's about as clear a case of causation as you can see. It certainly is no justification for this kind of practice that there are other deficiencies. It was no justification for school segregation that there was housing segregation, for example. Nor is it an answer to say that there are some broadcasters that have managed to overcome or adjust. No one should have to adjust the heart of their business because of a flawed technology. Uh, gentlewoman's time has expired. And let me just say before I move to the gentlewoman from California, um, a, a comment was made um, uh, that indicated that uh, the majority and minority uh, uh, decline has been basically the same. It's my understanding that uh, that's not true. It, um, I, I mean, Mr. Skarzynski indicated that basically the same when he responded to the gentlewoman from Washington, D.C. Is that true? Based on the last time I saw ratings data, that is not true. The uh, decline, there have been declines across st English language stations and urban stations and Spanish stations, but the decline for minority stations have been significantly lo uh, larger than they have been for the other stations. Mr. Chairman, could, could I ask that the data Mr. Jarzinski was relying on be submitted to the chairman so that the committee can evaluate that data for itself? Right. With, with yeah, yes, I'd be happy to provide the data. Without objection, we'll receive it. Um, um, gentlewoman from California. Um, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for holding this hearing. Just an observation, where's the other side of this committee? Great and, observation. Uh, <laughs> it'd be, the subject matter probably is of little interest. Uh, just an observation. Um, I'm listening very intently because I represent the area where uh, KJLH's listeners are, that Stevie Wonder's uh, station. And um, Mr. Scherzinski, um, 
I understand that you look at centrist, uh, census data uh, to weigh your numbers to account for any uh, under or over represented demographic groups. And my question or problem is that the census has a historical tendency to undercount youth, uh, low income, and minority households. Uh, I sit on the census subcommittee and one of the things I brought to the attention of the director of the census is that um, in certain areas, there's always an undercount. And because of that undercount, we are denied the funds that should come uh, based on certain demographics. Do you account for this historical undercount of the census when compiling and analyzing your data and if so, how do you do it? Congresswoman, we look at census data and then we update it each year with, and the month of, during the month of October with data from Claritas. So the way that we would focus on the total market uh, to, to get a representative sample would be to use both the census data and the Claritas data and to go after... What is the difference between... The, the, the census data you, you know about. Yes, since I you, know about. Since you, you care for it uh, here uh, in the Congress. The Claritas data is a update from a third-party private, not the government, but from a third-party private firm that looks at census and tries to update it for any possible shifts that occur within a given year. But to go after a representative sample and to care for particularly uh, uh, African American and Hispanic listeners, we focus on what we call high density areas and try to get as representative a, a group of African American and Hispanic listeners uh, for, for the total market within certain high density areas. Let me just say this, uh, that's one of the problems. Yes, there is high density, but they don't get counted. And I am a witness of that. I live in the community. And uh, I can tell you that uh, because of the fear some of our non-English speaking uh, citizens or well, people have, they don't give an accurate count. So I usually call in the census people and tell them how to go about the count. You go out on a Sunday after church services. You go to the parks, you go to the parking lot, you go above the liquor stores and the cleaners, and you can get a better indication. We are historically undercounted. And uh, it hurts us. You mentioned KJLH as a success story. It's not. And I was so disappointed that the people I usually go in uh, for interviews with uh, are now gone, and they've gone to syndication. So we're not really getting that information uh, to this broad listening audience out of the community that KJLH served. And, uh, you know, it's not real, it's syndicated. So the little peculiarities that exist in the community are not uh, really identified through interviews uh, from the representatives, such as those people at the county level, at the city level, at the state level, and uh, at the federal level. That's one of my problems. So um, I, I don't want to be that critical of the use of uh, portable people meter, the PPM. And uh, we find it's not focused on the underlying technology, but on the method used to recruit the people who have their radio habits measured. And you stated that Arbitron plans to increase the sample size by 10% beginning in 2010. But I worry this is insufficient because uh, since the introduction of the PPM, the panels have become 66% uh, smaller. And so uh, my question is, why did Arbitron reduce their panel size 
by 66 percent with the introduction of the PPM. Cong uh, Congresswoman, when we moved from the diary to the PPM, we had in any given market a paper and pen diary and we would issue this for two weeks of the year, two weeks in the year, sorry, or four weeks in the year. So at, in the larger markets, four weeks a year of data were the data for the diary keepers. When we moved to PPM, we have 365 days a year, 52 weeks a year of data, and the data that we have had, would have accumulated from the diary versus the PPM, it's a multiplier of probably eight, a factor of increase of eight to get the data and the, and the timely and granular data minute by minute, what are you listening to as between PPM and diary. So in making that migration or transition from the pen and paper diary to PPM, we reduced our panel size uh, on a uh, ratio of three to one. And we did that really in, in and studied what Nielsen had done when they went from their, tel their pen and paper uh, television diary to their electronic for form of measurement. They actually went from uh, four to one in, in terms of reduction. So we made this reduction and we did it because we were trying to maximize the use of persons day, days of, of a individual person that we're recording uh, for 352 weeks a year. Uh, Mr. Chairman, if you could yeah. yield me one more minute. I just wanted to see uh, what some of the other panelists uh, might be able to suggest uh, as to how we can General balance the need. Additional minute. Yeah, thank you. To cut costs with the responsibility to provide a sample size that is statistically reliable, and maybe some of the rest of you can give some input to this. Well, first of all, I'd like to comment on your earlier uh, comments about uh, representative samples, uh, because um, my, my concern here and what I believe is part of the problem and why we're here is that uh, we, the customers, have uh, talked. We have sat in meetings and we have talked to Mr. Skarzynski and other folks at Arbitron, but they aren't listening. The root cause and the, and the main problem that you touched on is that the samples that they're using are not representative. And they may tell you that, yeah, they have enough PPM carriers in your district, but are those carriers representative of the people who actually live in your district? Because how many of the people that you know that live in your district would accept carrying a meter for two years on the basis of getting a telephone call asking them to do so. The people who live in your area, the people who are listening to urban radio, who are listening to Spanish radio, are among the groups that are the hardest to get to cooperate. And because they're so hard to get to cooperate, you can't just call them on the phone and ask them to do it. You might be able to call them and ask them to fill this out for a week. You can't call them and ask them to carry this around for two years. It's a very different task. And so the people who do agree to do it are less representative and not representative of those listeners that are listening to urban radio and listening to Spanish radio. And therefore, they're not represented. You get the older members of those minority groups. You don't get the younger members of those minority groups. And all the waiting in the world can't adjust for a bad sample. I, I just have to comment, and I'll get back uh, that minute, <laughs> part, of, part of it. But our kids are going around with their iPhones and their cell phones and so on. They're certainly not going to carry that meter when they could be looking at uh, their other pieces of equipment. And it creates a problem for us in the community. I thank you for yielding me extra time. Thank you, Reverend. Thank you. And now we yield time, five minutes, to the gentleman from uh, Virginia, Congressman Connolly. 
I, I thank the chairman and thank you, thank the panel for being here. Um, Ms. Shagrin uh, and and uh, perhaps others on the panel, uh, <coughs> to what extent are some of the problems caused here by the fact that we, you know, for good or ill, Arbitron is a monopoly? Well, I don't think that. Uh, I think there are a lot of people who would make other choices. They are, and I think there are other people who aren't in this room or representative by, represented by anyone that's on any of the panels that would make other choices. We're not the only ones that are aware of the failings of the current rating system. And again, it's not the technology I'm talking about. It's sample. It's getting them to, to agree to be in the sample and then provide usable data on a regular basis. Got it. So, so your problem, the technology is fine. I don't know. I haven't seen it. You work with a good sample, but I'm assuming that it does measure okay. radio. It, it's the sample. Mr. Ivey, would you concur? <coughs> you got to speak up, sir. You got to put my, that. My mic wasn't on. Thank I would, you. I would phrase that a little differently. I think what's important to remember, and Ms. Chagrin said it initially, is when you approach somebody to carry this device, a certain amount of them agree to carry it and a certain amount of them don't. And the more that agree to carry it out of the original sample, the better the sample is, well, well, let me, generally. Let, let me and, ask you a question about that, following up on the comments you've made and Ms. Shager made. Um, uh, uh, what's the failure rate? What, what percentage of people who agree initially actually end up dropping out? Well, there, so if you look at a response rate for the service, which is I approached 1,000 people to carry this device, how many of them actually agreed? Those numbers are ranging from. No, I'm not asking that question. Of those who've agreed, right? What's the what's the dropout rate? It's in general across the population, it's about 25 percent. 25 percent. But if you look at PPM? that, focused in yes, oh, Mr. Ivey, I'm Congressman. Mr. Ivey, please. Answer the question. I have a limited amount of time. If I, I could answer the I, question, I was going to turn to you in a second. 25% uh, is your estimate of the people on PPM who drop out. Right, but that's differential among different groups of the population. Fair Younger enough. people drop out more than older people. I got it. I I'm sorry, Mr. Uh, Smithsinski, you wanted, you wanted to comment? We, we stand up a panel for a two-year period in a given PPM market. A panelist can serve on average for 12, 13, 14 months. When that panelist leaves, we replace that panelist with someone who is identical in demographic to that panelist. But is the dropout rate for, P for PPM higher than the previous dropout rate for the we're, diary? We're mixing two issues. I'm, it, I'm sorry. It, it's a different methodology. I understand. The diary is only for one week. If you serve for the week, then you're done. So you're not concerned with the dropout rate being a problem? We, we don't. In, in our methodology, we don't think that that figure is a bad figure. I understand, but you've heard testimony here from your fellow panelists that part of the problem may be less the technology and more the size of the sample. If the sample size itself is too small and unrepresentative, and then a fairly significant chunk of that sample drops out, your, your sample is even smaller and less <coughs> representative. That's uh, sort of where I'm getting. Mr. I, Mr. Yeah. Ivey, did you want to comment? But, yeah, but the, I wanted the to comment. The comment I was making, Congressman, if uh, Ms. Shagrin was in the panel and she drops out, we're not saying that panelist goes away. We fill that seat with someone from a comparable, identical demographic. Okay, so you so think the, the, dropout, so the dropout problem is non-existent? It, it, because of the way we would make a replacement, it, it is not the issue. Ms. Shagrin. Well, first of all, speak up, please. Afri African Americans and Spanish-speaking Hispanics or Hispanics drop out more than non-Hispanic than non-minority panelists, and certainly the, the 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 kids and teens are so bad. I don't even want to get into that. But you know, heaven help you if that's who you're programming to or that's who you're trying to advertise to. Right. Uh, th the point is that he that when, if I were in the panel and I drop out, he might try to get someone else, but all he knows is a phone number and some general characteristics of the household. Uh, last time I read an audit report, you were not doing quota sampling, but you're getting close. Gotcha. But the point is that the person they get may be female, uh, may live in a household where they're the only person, as I do, 
but what they choose to listen to may be completely different than what I choose to listen to because of my ethnic background, right. because of my professional background. So just because you lose some, the people who agree, I mean, there's been very extensive studies done now on non-response. The people who agree are not necessarily representative of the people who don't agree, which is why I am such a strong proponent of in-person recruiting. Mr. Ivey? Yes, I, I'm just uh, concerned that we're might be mixing terminology. You can drop out of the sample permanently. In other words, you could call Arbitron, I no longer want to participate permanently. They call that a dropout. What I was quoting, the 25%, are failures of people to carry the PPM on the average day. So they remain in the panel, and then if they don't carry it today, they're still in the panel tomorrow, and they can either carry it or not. Gotcha. That's about 25%. And that's not a dropout. That's just a failure that day to tabulate. That varies a lot by demography. Younger people drop out more than older. Young blacks especially, young African Americans, they drop out of this panel much more than, right. let's say, other I, young people. I, I'm going to have time for just one more question, if the chair will indulge me, um, and then I've got to go. Uh, and I'll start with you, Mr. Ivey. The, the, uh, the MRC has not accredited Arbiton's PPM service in New York. Philadelphia and Houston. Uh, why is that, and could whatever problems are reflected in those markets possibly be affecting the market here in Washington, D.C., which, after all, the city itself is a majority minority population surrounded with huge minority populations, and intuitively it just seems hard to believe that a lot of those minority-owned uh, uh, and broadcasting uh, radio stations are precipitately declining. Yes. Uh, first of all, just a clarification. We have accredited Houston. Ah. We haven't accredited, and we've accredited Riverside. All the other markets are not accredited, just to clarify. There are three principal reasons why the markets that aren't accredited aren't, aren't accredited. The first is the response rates to the service are lower than we would expect. So earlier I mentioned the thousand people you approach, how many people eventually say they will cooperate? Um, you know, if that, the closer that number or the lower that proportion is, the less likely that sample is to be representative of the population, even if you replace them, because you might replace them with other people that you think look alike, but they might behave differently. It's nuance. So response rates to these services, and they're in exhibits F and G of, of my written testimony, are lower than we would like. The second issue is non-compliance or non-tabulation rates in general. That 25% rate that I quoted, um, generally, you know, it had been worse than that. Arbitron has been making improvements, making improvements. Those, those rates are still a major concern of ours that overall not enough people are, are get, having the data gathered from the service. And then the third, and perhaps most important, I mentioned that people that don't cooperate don't cooperate differentially. So young African-American adults, for example, while I showed that chart in Atlanta and Boston that showed what, how they look, if you looked at that chart for young African-Americans, those numbers would even be lower. Sometimes they're 60, sometimes they're 65%. Uh, that means that 40% of the people don't carry their PPM on the average day. So automatically you've heard talk about sample sizes and how Arbitron, and this is legitimate, they reduced the overall sample size from the diary because you get a lot of measurement from people, so you're allowed to do that. But then, if 40% of young African Americans fall out of tabulation because they don't carry it, that puts even more stress on your sample. If you're relying on that target, then you're relying on only that reporting sample. And that's a smaller group. So I've explained three principal issues. Those are the three key issues that we're focused on getting Arbitron to improve. I, They're very critical. We're not going to credit until we believe those have been improved to a sufficient degree. And, and those samples report in a representative manner across various types of demography. We're not going to credit until that happens. Mr. Uh, thank you very much. Mr. Chairman, my time is up, and I thank you for your indulgence. I do want to say that. Um, representing the local area here in the National Capital Region. Uh, Mr. Ivey's just put his finger, I think, on, with the best of intentions, the methodology uh, can lead to results that have devastating impacts on minority-owned 
broadcasters and, and radio stations, and we've already seen that here in the National Capital Region. So I, I thank you for holding this hearing, and I look forward to working with Arbitron and others to see if we can't make sure that we're all at a certain comfort level with the data and what it means. Thank you. I'd like to thank the gentleman for, for his statement. And I yield five minutes to the gentleman from uh, California, ranking member, Congressman Issa. I, I thank the chairman and uh, I apologize for my having to go back and forth. We have a markup in judiciary next door. And as you know, uh, as important as hearings are, markups are recorded. Uh, uh, the, uh, the questions that, that I have, uh, I think, are going to, going to deal with accuracy, but, but maybe with, with some rhetorical questions. Uh, Ms. Uh, Sh Sh Chagrin, Chagrin, you were at Nielsen for 25 years, right? 27, yes. 27. Were you perfectly accurate? Uh, were there I, complaints by stations, TV stations, that your ratings were skewed, inaccurate, not what they wanted? In other words, if you didn't give them the number they want, did they complain? Uh, not not so much. Can you turn your mic on? I'm sorry. Uh, for a long period of time, there were Arbitron and Nielsen were both measuring uh, local television. And there was, uh, and, and sure, they liked the ones that were the Okay, stations. well, let's, let's follow up on that questioning a little bit. You called yourself a customer. Now, aren't you really an audited firm, but not a customer in the true sense? When you buy the results, choose to buy the results, uh, you're somewhat of a customer. But realistically, aren't you simply being audited uh, for honesty, integrity, a little like a, a public SEC company? They pay uh, uh, PricewaterhouseCoopers, but in a sense, PricewaterhouseCoopers allegiance is to the truth. Isn't that true? Uh, that, that's true, but I am a customer. I work for Univision, and I am a customer. Right, but Enron was a customer of their accounting firm, and we had a national scandal because Enron got the accounting it wanted. Are you entitled to the accounting you want, or are you entitled to the best accounting available, and that's what you have to ask for, is the best and most accurate numbers available? Which is it? The, the best accounting available. Okay. So I'm going to go However, to However, sometimes... There is no best accounting. Very true. And that's exactly the follow-up I want. Mr. Uh, Skarzynski, uh, you're not perfect. Your numbers aren't perfectly accurate. Isn't that true? A absolutely true. And I'm, I'm not perfect, and, and our and, numbers are not perfect. And even it's though a I know random sample. And even though I understand you don't release the exact amounts, you pay blacks, Hispanics, and young people more money to carry these PPMs than you, care, than you do Overall, in other words, there's a skew toward the hard-to-get groups, hard-to-get-to-carry groups. Is that true? We do pay a differential incentive in some markets if we're having problems getting that Okay, but differential to... is a term for more. Correct. Okay, so you pay more when you believe you're not getting the level of carry that you need to get the accuracy you need, right? We do in some, on some okay. occasions, Was yes. that tendency as evident when you were doing paper diaries as it is when they're carrying a completely accurate electronic device? In terms of a differential response, yes. Yes, yes it so, was. So you already had this. This is not a new problem. This is it, a problem that already existed. It, it would, be, would have been, and we do have a diary market today for the markets number 49 through 303, so we, we, we do see that in the diary. Okay, so we do have a problem. Young people love to carry a cell phone but have a problem with a pager <laughs> when it doesn't deliver messages to them. Perhaps if you could embed your rating system in a cell phone and hand them a cell phone, this problem would go away. If you gave someone a free cell phone for a year or two, I guarantee, I guarantee you'd have a high carry rate with the young. Well, Congressman, that was Congresswoman Watson's suggestion to us, and actually that, that's a next generation product for us that we're looking so at we, just So that. as soon as you get that, uh, Diane and I don't have to be uh, berating you in a public hearing, right? Well, I, I certainly don't, <laughs> don't view it as being berated. Look, anytime you're called monopolistic at the opening, you're, you've got a little bit of a problem with the dais. Uh, I am concerned, along with the chairman, that, uh, that in fact there's an accuracy question. I'm going to close with one question. I want to be very succinct here today. Is the electronic machine, the PPM machine, in, 
in dispute as to its accuracy here today. Is there anyone that's disputing it? I only want to see a yes if you're disputing the accuracy of the product. Is it, is it reasonably fail safe? Okay, seeing no response, what we have is a better piece of equipment. Mr. Skarzynski, what I hear today is that your purported customer, and I view the advertiser, having been an advertiser, as your most important customer because I demand the accuracy to, in order to make good decisions with my money, which ultimately I'm her customer uh, as an advertiser, and that's, that's what we're trying to achieve uh, when we're on the other side of it. Can you just briefly tell us how does this committee have a high confidence that with an accurate piece of equipment, you're going to take care of the other problems that today have been called in doubt. And, and Mr. Liggins is going to be up in a minute, and uh, he uh, is a little different than, than this first panel. He actually, although he is going to talk about the same problems, he's hopeful that you're going to get there. Would you tell us how you're going to get to the level of accuracy, knowing that the tool isn't the problem, but in fact that these other problems exist? What are you going to do in the next uh, 12 months so you don't have to be back here again? Well, Congressman, we are improving our performance. Mr. Ivey put up some charts there and talked about how we're performing in certain levels. If you were to look at in, in, in Appendix B of, of our written testimony, we have the data for all of our markets that goes through the month of November. We're performing at a much higher level uh, for all, all markets. It's based on improvements that we're making to the sample size and the sample quality that we're making across the board. We're getting these suggestions from our customers and from the MRC staff. And we're committed to making our service the very best service that it can be. Thank you very much. If anyone else wants to answer briefly. Thank you, Congressman. First, I should have put my hand up when you asked if anyone questioned the accuracy of it, because it's accurate if you're talking about measuring stations that are encountered. If what you're trying to find out is what people listen to, it isn't and can't possibly be accurate because people often encounter stations and they're not listening. They're not paying attention. They're not listening to the advertisements. Um, the other question if, if, that I think you're going to is, is really the heart of what we're here for, which is what is the duty of care? These things are understandably relative, but we have a, a, a lot of precedent on that. This is somewhat analogous to the reason why we hold surgeons to a higher standard than general practitioners. What we have here is a company engaged in the highest level of statistical research. This isn't a sophomore class in statistics learning how to do this. And you find, surprisingly, someone who used to teach sophomore statistics, you find grossly unrepresentative samples by race, ethnicity, and age. You find the lack of a measure of engagement such that those who command high loyalty, whether it be uh, black or Spanish radio personalities or Sean Hannity, are, under count, are, are undercounted. Now, I, I'd be happy to hear more, but the chairman has limited uh, ability to give me time. And this hearing is strictly on the diaries versus the PPM. So to a great extent, we're trying to limit how, with the new tool, changes need to be made to be more accurate, we, we can't necessarily look at, at the entire history of everything that's not right with this company. So, uh, Ms. Uh, uh, Shagrin, if you had something briefly, please. The, the tool may, re, may accurately record and, and report what people are exposed to, but the gist of the matter is, are the people who are carrying the tool representative of U.S. America? in all ways and for minorities as well as non-minorities by age. And that, I think, the answer to that question is no. The best tool in the world with a bad sample does not give you good data. Thank you. Thank you for a succinct answer. Thank, Thank you. you. Ranking members, time has long expired. Um, gentleman from Texas, Mr. Cuellar, five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Skrinski, um, taking into account that uh, I believe Abertron has been sued by four attorney generals, New Jersey, New York, Maryland, Florida, taking into account that Abertron has failed to receive accreditation uh, from the MRC for many of the markets, taking into account uh, that there's been issues about methodology 
uh, taking into account the testimony we've heard here and people who are sitting behind you, um, wouldn't it be better for you to listen more to your direct customers and try to implement some changes while keeping the accuracy uh, of the information than having a legislative fix? Congressman, we listen to our customers and we have a set of improvements that we've made based on customer input that has improved our performance. And as I mentioned in uh, response to uh, Congresswoman Chu's uh, question, we feel that we're performing at a level uh, in nine markets, including New York, where we have earned MRC accreditation. So we're very open to receiving inputs. We have a very active program to, to take any changes, any improvements that we make, and not just put them in one market, but put them in all markets. And we're committed to making our service the very best service that we can, that we can make. Can you, uh, uh, Ms. Shigeri? I'd like to ask Mr. Ivey to confirm or not confirm the statement that Mr. Skarzynski just made about eight or nine markets being ready to be accredited. I mean, with all respect. I thought, I thought it was only two markets. You don't earn accreditation until we grant it, so it's not earned yet. Um, the, I, I mean, that's simply how I would state that. I do want to correct one thing or at least make a statement because I don't want to leave the committee with a misimpression. Uh, the ranking, ranking member, ISA, was talking about uh, paying people more to, uh, if they're African American or they're problematic in terms of cooperation, gaining cooperation from. Um, we don't think, Arbitron uh, provides substantial incentives to people, financial incentives to carry this device and participate. We are actually not of the opinion that a lot more money is what's necessary here in terms of payments to panelists. In fact, there's an element of danger there. Like if you pay people too much, they might change their behavior based on that. And you don't want to change their behavior. You want to measure their behavior. So we're looking at other avenues, more uh, contact to panelists, training to panelists, strategies to convince them, uh, a young African-American panelist, why it's important to carry this device, why, why it's meaningful to them as a, you know, it doesn't message right. back to you. It's not a cell phone yeah. or something. Let, let me, it's uh, not a money thing. No, thank you very much. Let me just ask a few more questions. Um, what happened with those four um, uh, suits that were brought in by the attorney generals? There, there were questions on the uh, methodology issues that are being brought up here today, is that correct? The suits were focused on the uh, alle allegation that we're undercounting minorities. Which is sort of the same type of testimony we're hearing today from in, Mr. In part, part, in part, I, I think. W were those uh, suits settled? We, we have not, we have settled the suits with New, the New York Attorney General, the New Jersey Attorney General, and the Maryland Attorney General and we are meeting all of our obligations under, under those settlements. The Florida Attorney General uh, came up uh, just in the last few months and we're in discussions with the Florida Attorney General. Okay, so they were settled uh, on the basis that there were questions about methodology, s similar issues that we're bringing up today. N not questions on methodology so much as the issue around the, under, the allegation of undercounting okay. Uh, black and Hispanic listeners. Which is a concern that uh, I think it's being brought up here today. Y uh, yes, it is. It, so, and, in, and in the I settlement. Mean, wh wh why wait for a lawsuit or why wait for a legislative fix? I mean, why not just sit down with the customers and, 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 and still, you know, have the end result of getting accurate information? Why not sit down? I mean, if I was a monopoly, it'd be a lot easier for me to say, be different than if I had four or five other competitors that were providing the same service. I, I, I don't want to tell you how to run your business, but if I had customers that had been forced to go into two years instead of uh, one week, uh, questions about the, um, instead of using census demographic information, using your own target levels for demographic uh, representativeness on the panels, um, 
cutting down, cutting down the participants when you had the diary by 66 percent, I mean, those are legitimate questions. You know, look, the, the way I see it, I, I come from a district that's about 78 percent Hispanic, uh, uh, minority, mainly Hispanics. I come from, a, from the city that has now turned pretty much minority majority state now. Uh, you look at the demographics for the United States, you look at the purchasing powers of his, if you include the blacks to be higher. I mean, those customers there, I mean, the way I see it, I mean, either you're gonna be sued or you're gonna get a legislative fix. I mean, if I was you and I don't wanna tell you how to run your business because you're the, the expert, I'd rather sit down with them and say, what other changes do we need to make? I know what you're saying, that you're listening to your customers. But if you look to the person right next to you uh, or other folks, they're saying no. We sit down with our customers on a regular basis. We sit down with them on an individual basis. We sit, we have a radio advisory council where all, all broadcasters are represented. Univision actually has two members on the radio advisory council. We have an advertising agency council where advertising agencies, including Hispanic and, and urban advertising agencies are present. We, we do a great deal to listen to our customers and we act on those inputs. A anything we can help you because if, if you were totally listening to your customer, customers, we wouldn't be having this legislative hearing. Uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. For thank, thank, thank you very Mr. much. Yeah. And now you have five minutes from gentleman from Missouri, Mr. Clay. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair. Um, just to uh, piggyback on what my friend from Texas just said, uh, um, you know, with the introduction of Arbitron's PPMs, uh, several markets have been negatively impacted uh, uh, by poor methodology and undeveloped uh, technologies. Even in my home district in St. Louis, uh, uh, long established. Um, minority-owned radio station, KATZ-FM, um, fell victim to the late, latest string of closings. Uh, let me uh, ask Ms. Chagrin. Uh, Univision was able to end their contracts with Arbitron in two markets. Uh, basically, why was this decision made? Uh, when um, when Arbitron proposed, when the Houston market was rolled out and the methodology in Houston is different, we signed a long-term contract. When Arbitron changed the methodology to the radio-only methodology, I had a lot of concerns in terms of what they, whether or not they would be able to recruit and maintain a representative sample. Uh, because of my background, I realized what those problems would be and encouraged Arbitron at that time to make some changes in tr of, of how they recruited. Uh, and Okay, okay look, uh, ma ma Ms. Chagrin, I'm going to ask for the short I'm version, sorry. okay, I'm sorry. because I only get five minutes. Now, let me ask you, on average, uh, how much does it cost to subscribe to Arbitron's uh, and are these rates higher than before? The rates are significantly higher than they were for a diary market. Thank you so much. Mr. Skarzynski, um, clearly Univision's decision uh, to decline your services and the PPM's lack of accreditation signals uh, that your results are not accurate and negatively impact minority stations. Uh, how can you justify charging stations uh, through exclusive and binding contracts for inaccurate information uh, that can end their business. Congressman, Univision did not break their, con our, their contract with us. The contract was up for renewal. They did not renew. So that, that's the specific issue around Univision. We feel that we have a solid methodology and solid technology. We believe that we have a, a, and we've had a very, very strong performance in 2009, and we think we have a representative and valid uh, survey. And we're, we're proud of what we do, and we are 
confident that we're, we are providing the best service that we, that we possibly can, and we are not uh, focused at all on trying to hurt any of our customers, including Hispanic. How do you, how do you adjust for the skewered results then of the, you know, of, of, of the different demographics? How do we, how do we fix that? In terms of the, our, our performance against our methodology, we are performing at a similar level, at a comparable level for African American and Hispanic listeners as we are for white listeners. Mr. Ivey showed some charts and he showed a, uh, some dips in, in particular in the summer. We have a, a problem with seasonality in the summer, okay. but all of those levels of, of we, of performance are levels that we share across the board. We okay, don't have but, a different level of but, performance. But now, to my understanding, you are using 66 percent fewer individuals on your PPM panels than when you use the diary method. You have also used your own target demographics instead of using reliable census data to accurately reflect your market. When these smaller panels are then broken down by ethnicity, and other demographic sample sizes are quite small. How can you possibly measure a station's audience accurately with such a small sample? Well, Congressman, we do use census data. That, that, that would be just to uh, uh, comment on that. In terms of how Arbitron research compares to other consumer research, uh, the Gallup poll, for example, that you're quite familiar with has a sample size of 2,400. Uh, the uh, J.D. Power uh, vehicle study has a sample size of 46,000. Our uh, current sample size for the country mm -hmm. is on the order of uh, 55,000 right now. So we, we feel we have a, a statistically significant sample size. Okay, but, but, but how does this much smaller sample size account for unexpected results such as uh, Suburban, for instance, suburban listeners listening into an urban station and other ways in which American cultures intersect. I mean, sometimes I listen to Charlie Pride, believe it or not, or gospel. Well, that Congressman, so. we work with all radio broadcasters in a given market in St. Louis, so we would be encoding the stations, every station in St. Louis. We do that. We don't charge any money for a particular station. And in terms of covering the market of St. Louis, we, wouldn't, we would cover a listening area as opposed to just the city limits of St. Louis. So we would cover uh, suburbs, and we would get a representative sample that would map to the demographics of St. Louis uh, based on census data updated each year for Claritas data. Okay, but Dr. Barry Blesser stated that weak encoding signals can prevent the PPM from recording certain stations what is Arbitron doing to correct technical issues uh, with the PPM that can negatively impact smaller stations with weaker signals? We're aware of Dr. Blessing. He did his study. He didn't contact Arbitron when he did his study. We're aware that he published his report. Uh, we have been in con consultation with the MRC staff about that report and about that issue, and we don't feel that that particular comment uh, is, a, is an accurate comment by Dr. Blessing. Okay. I, I, I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for your uh, 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 I want to let you know you have nothing to yield back, but anyway, um, <laughs> the language sounds good. Yeah. I yield to the gentleman from, uh, Cal from, from Massachusetts. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, am I missing something here, or does taking the, the human elephant element out of it, the reporting element out of it, really create a problem? For instance, if I've got one of your PPM devices on, Mrs. Kaczynski, and I go into an elevator a couple times a day and I'm not listening but I'm subject to that music, or if I go in a shopping mall and into the individual stores, I mean, every time I'm walking around I'm probably not listening to that stuff, but it's being recorded as if I'm a listener. Is that right? That is correct, Congressman. We measure the radio that you're exposed to. Right. So if you're in the elevator or in a shopping center or having a lunch with Congressman Clay, and you're both focused on your conversation, but you're exposed to a, radio, a particular radio Still gets station. Measured. We're measuring that. Why is that important? It's important for advertisers to know how much exposure do 
does an individual have to radio? I, I guess I'd, if I were an advertiser, I want to know whether somebody's listening or not, not whether they're exposed to it. I mean, that, that's just a personal preference, I guess. But if I'm going to spend money, I want to know that somebody's not just stuck in an elevator talking to somebody else and stepping out. I want to know that they're, they're actually listening to it. But um, Mr. Ivey, are you familiar with the terms of the three settlements and litigation that, uh, that resolve? I'm familiar with the terms of the New York and New Jersey settlements. Do they the other those terms and the obligations to Arbitron under those settlements at all address any of the issues that you think were important for accreditation? Well, you should, uh, I should let you know that both of those organizations subpoenaed our records. So they understood when they reached those settlements what our audit findings and discussions with Arbitrons were. However, I would say that uh, both New York and New Jersey set certain performance levels for Arbitron, particularly I'm thinking about the compliance levels. So they needed to have, you know, all the various demographic groups comply at certain rates with carrying the PPM. And some of those rates are lower than the MRC would desire. So the settlements reached by the, by the attorney generals that I'm aware of, the two, New York and New Jersey, are actually not the same levels that we would seek uh, to to set, but they looked at those. They looked at our documentation when they sent those levels. I believe, Congressman. May I make Mr. a Grin, comment? I'd like to go to Mr. Grin first. I think she indicated she'd like to comment. Uh, just, and, just a point of order. They are not uh, settlements. They are consent decrees. In each uh, with all of the AG discussions or lawsuits were consent decrees, which means that they could be reopened at any time. Mr. Skarzynski, did you want to make a comment? The settlements with the New York Attorney General and the New Jersey Attorney General. The consent decree or the General, settlement? Pardon me? The settlement or the consent the decree? The settlement follow the metrics of the MRC and look at particular periods of time, beginning June for the New York AG, uh, the June, October, and December of this year, and June of next year. What's the, what was the motivating factor for you not just going to the system that you used in Houston and uh, Riverside, San Bernardino, and just implementing that everywhere because you knew that had been approved and you were ready to roll? Is it just cost or what's the other factor? The system that we use in Riverside, San Bernardino, which is accredited, is the system we're right. using That's everywhere a, in the as country. was the one in Houston, which is why Pardon I'm me? asking you, why don't you just implement those systems everywhere? Uh, the system we use in Riverside, San Bernardino, is the system we're implementing across the country. The system in Houston was developed and, and set up at a time when we were working in cooperation with Nielsen, whereby the same panel was going to measure, have the audience measure television for Nielsen and radio for Arbitron. Nielsen and Arbitron after starting that uh, methodology in Houston, Nielsen decided to, that they didn't want to pursue that, and, we, and hence that's, that's the explanation as to why we're using a radio first methodology, which it was accredited in Riverside San Bernardino, and we're using that elsewhere in the country. Mr. Ivey, do you agree that the, uh, the Riverside San Bernardino uh, product is what's being brought countrywide by Alberton? Yes. Okay. Can you explain it to me then why so, it's good in one place yeah, and not in others? A, it's a very complex issue because we, we look at Arbitron's performance and their compliance with our standards and we accredit a market and then we don't know what happens after that. We have to rely on Arbitron to maintain that performance. So when Riverside San Bernardino was implemented, it had among the highest performance that we had ever seen. For example, the charts that I showed earlier that showed uh, male and female carry rates for, or tabulation rates for the PPM, and if you remember, Atlanta was maybe 70 or something like that. At the time when we accredited Riverside, those rates were, between, were over 75 and some were over 80%. But what's happened since in Riverside is that performance has fallen way down. So Riverside looks very similar to the other markets. So the MRC is faced with a complex question. What do we do with Riverside? We've accredited Riverside. Arbitron has 
had that performance decline significantly, and if I could amend the record, I have a chart that actually illustrates that for you for Riverside. The chairman, I ask that the chart like be put in it. with uh, unanimous consent. Without objection. Thank you. So ordered. Can you, can you explain why San Bernardino changed? I can't. It has to do with how Arbitron interacts with its panelists. Some of it, as Mr. Sarzinski said, might be seasonality, although the period I'm looking at for Riverside on this chart is from October when we accredited it to September. So when, when Mr. Skarzynski says he believes that in however many markets it was, seven or eight markets, they've earned accreditation, well, we're looking at Riverside and we're saying, okay, if we accredit, what's going to happen next month? So what we need from Arbitron is dis a demonstration that their performance can be sustained because it wasn't sustained in Riverside. I urge you to take a look at this chart in Riverside. So we're, we're trying to assess what we do with Riverside. It is accredited right now. We made a decision to accredit it. It's difficult for us to remove accreditation. We're trying to figure out what to do with it, how to get our, we're trying to be constructive, improve it, try, just like the other markets. So this is a challenging issue here, trying to get these markets to have good performance that is sustained. I urge you to look at this chart for Riverside. Thank you. Now it is true that Houston has a totally different methodology. Uh, um, in several areas, the in-person recruitment, the in-person coaching. So Houston is a different system than the other markets, but, it's, but Riverside is the same. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Um, let me um, just indicate to um, the members that in about f five minutes or five or ten minutes, we're going to have votes. And so what I'd like to do, um, if it's okay, is to um, uh, release this panel, well, okay, votes are now, uh, and then we will recess for one hour, and then we will come back, in other words, and have lunch and all of that. Uh, let me just say, uh, before we um, recess, um, um, you know, I am, I'm very concerned, the fact that, you know, uh, that you're saying that you really have nobody, no supervision, you know, no anything, and that if you decide to roll something out, you roll it out, and of course, um, if if you ask to um, 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 uh, to wait, you just roll it out anyway, and it's serious business because some of these uh, radio stations are not going to be around. You know, uh, if something is not done and done very quickly, and I don't see the kind of commitment that uh, 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 that I would like to see, and I'm telling you, you know, um, I'm one that uh, do believe in legislation, and I want you to know that, and and I'm hoping that we can work this out and come up with some kind of an agreement before we move, you know, any further. But the point is that you know, if we do not, you know, um, because I'm looking, you say the FCC has no uh, a role. MRC, you know, they, they volunteer. They, they, that's good if they want to be invited. You know, you invite them. If not, you tell them to go home. You know, and, all, I mean, and I understand all that. But at the same time, I'm concerned about the fact that these minority stations, which are underrepresented right now, you know, and, and that over the last 30 years we've done a little something, and, uh, and now to lose that, really bothers me. And I think you need to know that um, uh, before we leave, we need to make certain that there's going to be some movement here uh, that's going to make it possible for to have the kind of reporting uh, that's going to be accurate and to make certain that these stations are able to stay around. Because when I hear of a station that's number one and you change the system, it becomes number 15. I mean, I, you know, I just have problems understanding that and just from a number standpoint. So I just want to make that you know, clear. We're going to uh, let this panel go, and we will, we, 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 we will come back at um, 1.30. And of course, uh, thanks again. But I want to let you know that uh, I'm troubled, and, and uh, we need to make certain that um, uh, uh, something is done here uh, that brings about the kind of accuracy that's going to help in terms of uh, these stations to be able to advertise, get business. And I understand the economic situation. I don't think I'm, you know, uh, uh, but when I look 
at the, the 20 percent difference, you know, I have to um, look at that. And also, the other question is, in terms of your bottom line versus, you know, what it was when you had the paper diary versus what it is now, you know, um, uh, that's an issue, you know, and I think that you might be cutting corners and at the same time you're cutting people out. Uh, we, we would actually will adjourn until 1.30.
The committee will reconvene. It's a long standing practice that we swear in all of our witnesses. So will you please stand and raise your right hand? Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? If so, answer in the affirmative. Let the record reflect that the witnesses all answered in the affirmative. Um, let me introduce our panel. First of all, we have Charles Warfield, has been president and CEO of the Inner City Broadcasting Corporation uh, since 2000 and is a 32-year veteran of broadcasting industry. His company owns 17 radio stations which target African Americans and urban audiences in New York City, San Francisco, Jackson, Mississippi, and Columbia, South Carolina. It is the second largest African American owned radio station company in the United States. Welcome. Uh, we also have uh, Frank Flores. Uh, started his career in the broadcasting industry in 1981. Since then, he has worked his way up from sales associate as a local station to this current position, chief revenue officer and New York market manager for Spanish broadcasting systems. Welcome. <coughs> Mr. Alfred Liggins is the president and CEO of Radio One uh, and president and chairman of TV One and LLC. Radio One is the largest multi multimedia company that targets African Americans and urban listeners. With 52 radio stations located in 16 urban markets, Mr. Liggins is responsible for the overall management and operations of Radio One assets. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, Jessica Pantanini serves as the Chief Operating Officer for Bromley Communications and uh, Firm, as well as the Vice Chair for the Association of Hispanic Advertising Agencies. Uh, Ms. Pantanini is recognized as a national expert within the evolving Hispanic marketing industry. Um, and of course, let me welcome all of you and that what we would do, we would start with you, Mr. Warfield, and we would just come right down the line, okay? Thank you. Chairman Towns, Ranking Member Issa, members of the committee, thank you for inviting me today to testify. As indicated, I'm Charles Warfield, and I am President and Chief Operating Officer of ICBC Broadcast Holdings, Inc. Our 37-year-old African-American-owned company operates 17 commercial broadcast radio stations that primarily target African-American audiences in New York City, San Francisco, Jackson, Mississippi, and Columbia, South Carolina. We have firsthand experience with the conversion of Arbitron rating surveys from paper diaries to the new personal people meter. Our stations have experienced a disproportionate reduction in the number of listeners reported by Arbitron's PPMs compared with stations that serve general audiences. The principal measurement that our industry uses is the average quarter hour ratings, which translates directly into the number of dollars that an advertiser will pay for running a commercial. The average quarter hour can be measured for various demographics. Advertisers on our stations are most interested in listeners between the ages of 25 and 54, or in some cases 18 to 34. In New York City, the adults 25 to 54 average quarter hour for our station, WBLS, had been a steady 0.8 or 0.9 for the last seven quarters in which Arbitron had used paper diaries for collecting data, which incorporates the period of fall 2006 through the spring of 2008. 
Immediately following the conversion to PPM, the average quarter hour from WBLS abrupt, abruptly dropped to 0.4 for September of 2008, a 50% reduction. The average, average quarter hour rating has fluctuated in the range of 0.3 to 0.6 for the 14 monthly rating periods beginning with that first report in September. Our formats did not change. Our audiences did not change. The only change was the PPM methodology. Arbitron also switched from paper diaries to PPM in the San Francisco market in September of 2008. And our station, KBLX FM, took a similar hit in that market. In the spring ratings book, KBLX's adults 25 to 54 average quarter hour was a 0.5. The first PPM report gave the station an average quarter hour of 0.3, a drop of 40%. Since then, each monthly PPM survey has shown a decrease of anywhere from 60 to 20 percent from the previous diary results. The same pattern shows up for stations serving African American and Hispanic audiences in other markets when PPM ratings are introduced. WDASFM and Philadelphia's top rated station, according to the paper diaries, suffered a 44.4 percent decline in its average quarter hour ratings for listeners 12 years old and older. Even more damaging was a 57.1 percent decline in its primary target demographics of adults 25 to 54. Also in Philadelphia, WRNB FM and WUSL FM incurred losses of 60 and 57.1 percent, respectively, in their 12 plus, 12 plus audience. KGLH FM, the Los Angeles station owned and operated by Stevie Wonder and managed by Ms. Karen Slade, who's in attendance here today suffered an 84 percent audience decline and dropped from number 20 in that market to number 40 with effectively no ratings. In Chicago, WGCI-FM, second ranked under paper surveys, lost 67 percent with PPM and dropped to number 12. In all of these markets, the only factor that can account for the precipitous deterioration is Arbitron's unaccredited ratings methodology. Plummeting ratings have shown up again and again for stations targeting African American and Hispanic audiences in other markets where Arbitron has introduced PPM. Ratings for stations using formats appealing to general audiences have been nowhere near as significantly affected. We do not believe the rating shifts are the result of the electronic measurement technology itself, but rather they stem from the methodology that Arbitron employs. The company has relied on telephone solicitation to recruit PPM survey panelists instead of address-based contacts. This change alone leaves out households with unlisted numbers and those that rely exclusively on cell phones. Young urban blacks and Hispanics are more likely to rely exclusively on cell phones than the average U.S. household. Arbitron has tried to make up for this with separately, for separate cell phone-only samples, but the numbers have been too small. Additionally, Arbitron is demanding that its PPM panelists make longer-term commitments to carry around a pager-sized device from the time they roll out of the bed until they return at night. Congressional hearings back in 64 made it obvious that ratings play a key role in the economics of commercial radios. The nonprofit MRC was formed to analyze ratings methodology and practices. So far, Arbitron has qualified as PPM service for MRC accreditation in only two markets, Houston and Riverside out of the 30 plus that it has rolled it out in. It demonstrated that a PPM survey can be accredited. The Houston project was a joint venture and it did demonstrate that the PPM survey can be accredited, but the recruiting process necessary is expensive, more than Arbitron wants to spend. Arbitron has been unwilling to invest the resources necessary to achieve MRC accreditation in any other markets. The reductions in average unit ratings and station revenues caused by the inaccurate report, PPM reports have left minority targeted stations battered and bruised. Then rubbing salt in our wounds is the Arbitron station contract. The standard form contract provided to stations by the monopolistic ratings company without, with little opportunity to negotiate its terms requires stations to actually pay Arbitron significantly higher fees once the inaccurate system is operating in our markets more money for less accuracy and lower revenue. The contracts do not require MRC accreditation. The math only benefits Arbitron, which can increase its profits by rushing PPM into markets with faulty methodology. We are dedicated to serving minority audiences in the markets where we have stations, as are other broadcasters who are members of the PPM coalition. It will be a far easier path to jettison this mission and program to the ratings 
by converting to run-of-the-mill plain vanilla formats. Large group broadcasters with clusters of stations in the market can already do that by shuffling formats among their stations. As minority owners, we have a strong sense of responsibility towards providing broadcast services that otherwise would be unavailable. Our coffers, however, are not bottomless, and our ability to sustain our business in the face of these problems is ultimately limited. Attorneys generals in four states have made attempts to ameliorate these problems, but even the simple concept of requiring Arbitron to secure MRC accreditation has thus far not been fruitful. We believe that this committee should send a strong message to the industry that something must be done to preserve diversity of programming and ownership in broadcasting. Requiring accurate and fair ratings data is one step. We believe at least this requires Arbitron to gain MRC accreditation before. Could you summarize, Mr. Warfield? Could you summarize? Yeah. Before any additional markets, I'm about to finish, sir. Before any markets are commercialized. Another is requiring Arbitron to release minority targeted stations from those burdensome contracts. And with that, I do thank you for the invitation today and welcome any questions as we continue. Thank you very much for your testimony. Uh, Mrs. Pantanini. Good afternoon, Chairman Towns, Ranking Member Issa, and Honorable Members of Congress. Thank you for the opportunity to address the House Committee of, on Oversight and Government Reform regarding the serious challenges and repercussions of the rollout and use of Arbitron's personal people meter. I'm Jessica Pantanini, Vice Chair of the Association of Hispanic Advertising Agencies and COO of Bromley Communications, a minority-owned Hispanic advertising agency. AHA represents 98% of Hispanic specialized agencies in the United States and more than 100 related industry suppliers such as research firms, media companies, production companies, all of which the vast majority of are small businesses. I'm here today because the specialized advertising industry is facing severe consequences resulting from the implementation of PPM currency. My testimony here is a culmination of numerous attempts and years of effort and resources to resolve sampling methodology challenges with Arbitron unsuccessfully. Arbitron's continuous improvement plan has yet to alleviate our concerns. What we need is a commitment to when we can expect PPM to be accredited, and I pray that it's before more minority stations are forced out of business. There are two points that I'd like to make. One, we support electronic measurement. We believe wholeheartedly that the industry move, needs to move in that direction and that PPM technology more accurately measures listening versus diary. This is not about PPM versus diary. It's rather about the methodology that fuels the data. In addition, while we may only represent a handful of Arbitron's clients, we are the ones that have a vested interest in the accurate measurement of minority audiences. It is our bread and butter. Our goal is to ensure that radio sampling methodology is reliable and fair so that AHA agencies and members can adequately deliver consumers and ultimately sales for advertisers. We depend on the independent ind endorsement of accrediting bodies such as the Media Rating, Media Ratings Council to provide us with the confidence we need to make appropriate media buying decisions. Because our membership represents a growing but smaller portion of the market as compared to the general market agencies and radio broadcasting companies, we don't have the resources to verify the data and subsequently rely heavily on the MRC. The bottom line is, is that Hispanic listeners are being represented inaccurately by Arbitron. And while Arbitron is making great leaps in rolling out PPM, they are only making small improvements in methodology, such as increasing the number of cell phone only households. Those changes are insignificant compared to the damaging impact that the rollout is having on our, on our industry. We need sustainable change and improvement on the sample now before additional markets are converted to this new currency. Radio is a critical element of our marketing mix and has been the backbone of our advertising outreach efforts for decades. Ethnic stations that were once ranked at the top have dropped significantly in the reported audience levels in PPM markets. We need your help to stop the commercialization of PPM without MRC accre accreditation or prohibit broadcasters from using PPM data until markets are accredited. Hispanic Americans are fueling the growth as indicated by the census in states such as California, Texas, and Florida, which are becoming majority minority. How is it possible that Arbitron can continue to improperly measure these audiences? In closing, what we ask is that Arbitron is 
really forced to gain accreditation in these markets. It's key for the success of the industry and has devastating impact to agencies, broadcasters, and advertisers alike. Thank you very much for your, your statement. Uh, Mr. Flores. Thank you very much for the opportunity, uh, Chairman Towns. I am uh, Frank Flores. I'm the Chief Revenue Officer of Spanish Broadcasting System, SBS, based in New York. SBS is the largest publicly traded Hispanic-controlled media and entertainment company in the United States today. SBS owns and operates 20 radio stations in the Hispanic markets of New York, Los Angeles, Miami, Chicago, San Francisco, and Puerto Rico, including four of the top-rated Spanish-language radio stations airing the tropical, Mexican regional, Spanish adult contemporary, and urban formats. For the purposes of brevity and not to, uh, not to recount everything that's been said before, let me just summarize a couple of important points. For all intents and purposes, Arbitron is an unregulated monopoly, the only recognized source of radio ratings in the U.S. today, especially in the markets where we operate radio stations. SBS, the company, has had an unblemished history as a client in good standing with Arbitron for over a quarter of a century. SBS was the first group owner to sign up for PPM. SBS was the first minority broadcaster to sign up for PPM. SBS wholeheartedly supports electronic measurement of all radio audiences. However, and this is a big point, significant modifications and alterations need to be undertaken in order for PPM to accurately reflect the listening levels of all minority audiences. The effects of PPM on Spanish radio have been devastating and in direct contradiction to the years of rating results provided by the di diary methodology. Worse yet, Arbitron is charging up to 60% more for its PPM ratings than it did for its diary ratings. SBS has offered to assist Arbitron in conjunction and cooperation with other radio colleagues in working on a universally accepted resolution to this PPM issue. Let me further state that the entire industry has been affected by the economy, and some will say that the economy in large part is solely responsible for the downtrend in our business. But there can be no argument that the ratings produced by the PPM methodology has also added greatly to our inability to price our inventory on a competitive basis, lending to these historic declines in revenue. In closing, the minority broadcasting has been unfairly our ability to serve our community. We are hopeful with working with all parties, including Arbitron, to find these solutions. Our goal, minority listeners, the best way, in our opinion, would be MRC accreditation in all markets, and we are resolute to be that our eventual goal. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Mr. Liggins. Thank you, Chairman Towns, Ranking Member Ice, and other members of the committee for providing me with this opportunity to testify. <clears throat> for those of you I have not met, let me introduce myself. I'm Alfred Liggins, CEO of Radio One Incorporated, and as you've heard earlier, we're the largest media company targeting African Americans in the United States. We're a multi-platform company that includes radio, internet, satellite, and our nationally distributed cable network, TV One. As owner of 52 radio stations located in 16 urban markets, I want to express both my support and confidence in the future of urban radio in a PPM world. My understanding is that during this hearing you are asking, does PPM affect the diversity of radio and is it contributing to minority radio's decline? I categorically say that I believe in both the short and long run, PPM is neither affecting the diversity, diversity of our airwaves nor contributing to the decline in minority radio. Rather, what PPM has done is expose some poor choices made during the good times before this recession hit. Some broadcasters became over leveraged, including ourselves, and perhaps expanded when they should not have, and some broadcasters launched urban formatted stations in markets where there were already established urban radio stations, many that we have owned and many that our colleagues in the minority radio business have owned and we drew competitors that we should not have. I do not believe that the commercialization of PPM is to blame for the problems currently facing some minority broadcasters. 
based on our own PPM experience, <clears throat> PPM does not discriminate against minority-owned broadcasters or urban formatted stations. There are always short-term dislocations and a learning curve when a new technology is adopted. But PPM is the new reality, and I would much rather get reality on the road now and keep it moving forward than to delay it. The heated dispute and controversy result primarily from the fact that the PPM device, as compared to the paper diary, can have a downward impact on the average quarter hour rating, or AQH, which is a result of dramatically increased QM audiences combined with lower amounts of time spent listening. The average quarter hour rating numbers with PPM are generally lower for most stations in all markets, regardless of format. Radio One has seen dramatic declines in its AQH ratings after PPM's commercial commercialization in a market. However, by designing our programming for a PPM world, including fine tuning our music, promotions, and commercial breaks, we have regained most, if not all, of our pre PPM rank positions without changing formats, although our audiences are smaller, our rank um, um, has returned and in many cases that ranks us as number one, two, or three in different markets. The reduction in rec uh, reported average quarter hour listing from diary to PPM is not, in my opinion, caused by racial bias, but rather is due to the fact that the diary is a subjective tool that asks participants to recall from memory what stations they listen to on the radio. In my experience, the diary service has a bias in favor of legacy stations or programs with a strong brand name or identity. PPM is a more objective measurement tool that plays no favorites and allows all stations to compete for listeners on a level playing field. The PPM is without question a major improvement over the diary service. It gives broadcasters a type of granular and timely data that the diary system simply cannot provide. For the first time, we can evaluate on a minute to minute, uh, minute by minute basis the listening habits of our audience, when they tune in, how long they listen, and when they switch to another radio station. This level of specificity allows us to respond almost in real time to listeners' tastes and show advertisers that we can attract listeners to our programming. That in turn translates into revenue for broadcasters. As a result of the internet, advertisers expect timely information to respond to ever-changing customer preferences. No matter the media, advertisers expect to see how many eyes and ears are paying attention. PPM is doing that for radio by providing clear, actionable intelligence on radio's audience. If PPM is not universally adopted, the radio industry is in danger of losing advertising dollars to other mass media and information platforms that have passive measurement systems. PPM contributes to advertisers' perception of the strength and value of brand conscious and brand loyal African American consumers who have almost a trillion dollars to spend annually. In short, electronic measurement provides compelling evidence about the power of urban radio. Through PPM, Radio One has been able to deliver reliable and credible measurement of our audiences to our advertisers. Some have said that PPM should take a breather, especially until it is fully accredited by the Media Ratings Council. My response is an emphatic no, as that would confuse advertisers who now rely on PPM and cause them to question the reliability of radio as an advertising medium. It would hurt the radio industry, not just Arbitron. While we acknowledge that Arbitron has not created a perfect service, in my opinion, we need to move forward with PPM, adapt to it, monitor Arbitron's progress, and offer our suggestions and concerns, work with Arbitron to make it better, and look forward to better times for all in the radio industry. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you very much. Let me thank you all, all of you for your, your testimony. And um, I also want to thank um, uh, Arbitron for staying and listening to your testimony. You know, um, sometimes people come in, they testify, and they leave. And but I want to let them know I respect the fact that they're staying to listen to what you have to say. You know, uh, it was so bad here at one point. You know, um, when people would testify, you know, and then all the agency heads would leave. I was in the position to um, have the people talk first, and then the agencies come behind them. But uh, I noticed that you know we don't have to do that today. They're staying and they're listening to you. To me, I want you to know I'm impressed with that because they appear to be concerned about uh, what you have to say, and um, that to me means a lot. Uh, let me begin by um, uh, first, I guess, um, um, by asking: um, uh, Have any of your organizations approached Arbitron? about problems with its methodology on accounting minorities? And of course, if you did, what happened? 
Uh, Mr. Chairman, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, uh, inner city broadcasting, at one point we owned a radio station in um, Philadelphia when Arbitron had a test market in Philadelphia with uh, PPM and the issues and concerns that unfortunately we're still facing today with the underrepresentation of minorities existed at that point. We had numerous discussions uh, as a, an African American broadcast with Arbitron in Arbitron's offices and our corporate offices in New York City that unfortunately did not bring about uh, the kind of improvements in the methodology that we thought were necessary before it could be commercialized. We specifically asked Arbitron not to commercialize the methodology until those issues uh, had been addressed, and unfortunately we're here today in 2009 still facing those challenges. Mm -hmm. Yes, Ms. Pantelani. Um, AHA has met with Arbitron several times. Um, one time in person and then had had several communication with them as well. Um, and Arbitron's response has been to provide us with more data um, to better inform us of why they were taking the positions that they were taking. Um, it is our sense that there was um, not a willingness to address the issues, but more of a willingness to provide context on their position on the issues. Uh, we've we've had uh, continual conversations with the good folks at Arbitron, trying to see if we could work out whatever um, issues there are on the table. Um, I can tell you that uh, we've been in this fight for about two years, or a little over two years, um, and they're at least they're at the point where they're willing to listen to what the issues are. Uh, two years ago, uh, they believed that they had no problems at all with the PPM. Uh, it, it, is a, it is a different mindset now. Mr. Lincoln, uh, you, are you a member of you, you, first of all, let me ask you this, that you um, uh, feel that the MRC, do you believe that the MRC offers a fair and accurate assessment of audience measurement services, the MRC? You feel they offer? Um, we, we are a member of the MRC. Um, our head of research, Amy Vokes, um, sits uh, on the MRC, and so she's heavily involved. I am not personally involved, since it's not my uh, particular uh, area of expertise. But in my involvement in this issue, um, I believe the MRC is a necessary body. Um, I believe there's a lot of smart people there working to make sure that we have accurate um, uh, uh, measurement and, and, and research. But I think one of the problems that you have with the MRC, it's a, it's a bit of a black box in that there aren't any defined benchmarks that some a company like Arbitron can meet or hit in order to, uh, to get accreditation. It makes it very difficult to create a business, roll out a business. I think um, uh, Mr. Skarzynski mentioned Nielsen and their, um, uh, uh, their electronic measurement system, which is still largely unaccredited because of the process and how long it takes and the fact that there's never a right answer. It's just a notification when we feel that you've met the criteria. Uh, so if it was possible to have um, a, uh, a goal that was set where Arbitron, if they hit these metrics, then they could get accredited. I think that this would be uh, a lot more practical and workable. But we're stuck with the system that we have. The MRC is what it is, and um, and as long as uh, uh, as it's operated in that manner, which I'm not questioning its validity, it's going to take a long time to get accreditation, if you will. Right. I guess let me ask um, the others here. Um, do you believe that Arbitron should continue trying to achieve accreditation through the MRC? <clears throat> right down the line. Uh, yet, oh, go ahead, go ahead, Frank. Most definitely. Uh, in fact, that we've said from from uh, from the get go, uh, and I'm speaking for the PPM coalition. Should Arbitron get MRC accreditation in the markets that that we are? Uh, competing in and operating radio stations, uh, our grievances will go away. So that has been that has been a, a prime focus of us since the very beginning, and we believe that's an important issue. Uh, as a small business um, and and aha representing those small businesses, I will tell you that we don't have the resources 
available within our organizations to be able to do the kind of due diligence that the MRC provides. And we believe that the MRC, their expertise, the due diligence that they provide, and their focus on um, auditing is extremely important to ensure the validity of data moving forward. And at uh, ICBC, we are certainly, as Frank had indicated, as members of the PPM Coalition, we are fully supportive of the MRC process and uh, have made it very clear that uh, our interest is to see the accreditation process completed by Arbitron. And as Frank indicated, the concerns that we have, we believe, would be addressed uh, with the completion of that accreditation, successful completion of that accreditation process uh, by Arbitron with the MRC. Mm -hmm. Let me, let me ask you this. What do you think accounts for this discrepancy? I mean, one of the, uh, the, the bigger, the main concerns that we have is the underrepresentation of uh, segments of our audience in the, in the markets that we operate in, San Francisco and New York. The uh, inconsistent delivery of a representative sample in, uh, in different age cells, 12 plus, 18 to 34, 25 to 54, uh, in, in many cases, as it was indicated this morning, it's not just African American. It can be young people that Arbitron consistently has a problem in delivering a representative sample. Uh, and we've asked for that from, from the beginning, but they have not been able to deliver that to give us a, uh, a product that we believe would be accurately represents our communities. All right. For us, it's also um, even a question of country of origin which came up early on when we were looking at some of the findings of the, the, uh, the PPM results in the, uh, the New York area. When we asked the Arbitron representatives, uh, had they taken country of origin into, into account, they, they said, why would we? And for people who operate in the Hispanic marketplace and provide radio, uh, you know, radio programs for the Hispanic marketplace, you have to know how diverse it is. And, and, and a Hispanic is not a Hispanic. A Mexican Hispanic is different than, than a Hispanic from the Caribbean. Their music tastes are different. Their, their language is slightly different. What works on the West Coast will not work on the East Coast. And what works on the Southeast Coast might not necessarily work on the, on the Northeast Coast. It is that diverse and that different. So if country of origin is not taken into account, well then, uh, you know, all you need is one format for the Hispanic and, and so be it. And that's not the case. That's not the case at all. So even something that we would think would be a give to them was a revelation. They looked at us and they said, why would we care about that? And, and now they've come around and now all of a sudden they're examining country of origin and that's part of what they're looking into. That's, an, that, that's quite a, a different stance than they had in the very beginning. So, and I think that that attributed to some of the initial results that we were looking at the PPM. Thank you very much. I now yield to the um, ranking member. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I want to follow up a little bit on that. Mr. Flores, my understanding is Arbitron now is asking country of origin and never did under the diary system. Is that, that's also your understanding? Yes. So that could, in fact, be part of why some people are dis, dis, disenchanted with the results is, to a certain extent, the more information you have, it's got to change results. If the results are going down or up, that could be a factor, right? It definitely could be a factor. And we're talking about results. There's an important factor that, that no one's talked to about this morning. And someone mentioned the economy, and someone mentioned how that's affected our business. And, and as I mentioned in my opening testimony, there could be no doubt that the economy has affected our business. But when you have ratings that are 60 or 70 percent less than they were before, and you have a depressed economy, and you have radio dollars that you're now fighting for that are less, okay, and now you're not number one or number two or number three in a market, you're number 14th or number 15th in a market, well then you're doubly affected. It's not only the economy, it's the, it's the economic impact that it has on the radio dollars coming in. Yeah, good, good point. Mr. Warfield. If Arbitron's new PPM had led to a 40 percent increase in your ratings, would you be here today? Uh, I would like to have had that. Uh, we would still be wanting to understand why there were such dramatic changes. No, that changes. wasn't the question. Is would, you be <laughs> <laughs> but, would I be here today? Yeah, I probably would not. You know, be. I, I, I suspect that the advertising public would be asking why, <laughs> why the cost of advertising on your station was going up. 
Uh, can we all admit that if you get an exact number of minutes that people are listening to a particular station, let me phrase that, have a particular station playing, that that will never indicate the value that that radio being on will have to a particular advertiser, that numbers alone will never cover it. Uh, that is correct. Number, numbers alone don't cover that, and we certainly uh, do talk about and do sell the value of our audiences as part of the selling process that, that our, our stations have always uh, followed. The difficulty you have, though, is when the results, uh, and this is not about diary versus PPM, is when you have such a disproportionate uh, reduction in audience across various formats that are just not explainable, uh, that's an argument that you really don't have a position for. So, and I understand. Mr. Liggins, I'm going to go through a series of questions for you. One, because you're our witness. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, eight people, we get one, you're it. Uh, but, but also because you, you, you deal with the same problems Mr. Warfield does. What have you done to show the value of, at a given numeric rating, the value to the advertisers of what you have to offer? In other words, if you're just a commodity rated completely based on Arbitron's numbers and your revenue completely rises or falls with those numbers and nothing else, isn't it true that, in fact, this would be devastating? And, and I'm not saying it isn't devastating, but it would be devastating and there'd be no recourse. But don't you, in fact, have to deal with what is the value and how do you demonstrate that to the advertisers on an individual basis after they've looked at your Arbitron number? Yeah, well, um, this as your witness, I'm hoping not to disappoint you. You're all you. of our witness, but, but you're but, the one we but, chose. But, but I'm going to tell you the truth. Um, if your ratings get cut in half, you know, you can demonstrate values to, value to advertisers, but it will not any, near, anywhere near make up for the landslide and falling revenue that you will have. Um, on the margin, you can demonstrate value, but advertising in this country is largely bought on cost per thousand as demonstrated by ratings. And whether that's on the internet or whether that's television or whether that's an outdoor um, message. So yeah, yes, you can create value. Um, you know, advertising is priced on supply and demand. So the more people who want your spots, the higher price you can pay. So if you act actually um, perform well for a large number of businesses, then more businesses will want the ads and you can raise the rates. But the fact of the matter is, is many advertisers don't even really track the response to you individually. Sure, as national rated, advertisers you're, you're using part, national you're, you're agencies. Part, you're part of a media mix. So um, at the end of the day, yeah, if ratings drop, get cut in half. And look, we have radio stations that have gotten hurt by PPM. In fact, I've got a station here in Washington, D.C. that's ratings weren't cut exactly in half, you know, but it's probably close to 40 percent and the revenue's down, you know, 40 to 50 percent. But I had other radio stations that did better because it showed us having more audience under PPM than the diary did. So net, 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 I was a fan of more accurate ratings because I felt that we would ultimately be better off hurt in some places, but helped in many others. So um, I think it's a misnomer to think that showing value can actually make up for the loss, the dramatic loss of ratings. Well, let me go through one more uh, round because if the chairman has indulgence. Uh, the. Uh, all, all four of you are basically here to tell us that minorities are being undercounted with PPM and that this problem is not diaries versus PPM, but it is a problem and you want to get it right. I'm going to ask each of you what you have done as industry leaders to get the correct count. In other words, and I'll just take you through, politicians do polls or have polls done for them. Pollsters do not take raw numbers and say, here's the results. Pollsters take raw numbers and they take various uh, algorithms, if you will, that have historically shown to be accurate, particularly when they're rating them to what an election day is going to be. Because the people that are actually listening and buying products, that's your election day. And the people that are being polled are, is, Al is Arbitron. That's really what we're dealing with, the poll versus what you say the reality is. Now. I rely on a pollster to, uh, to, to tell me the difference between the number he asks and what it really means or will mean predictively on Election Day. I don't do it very often, but I've done it enough. What have you done as industry leaders to create some sort of a legitimate answer to Arbitron? Here is what you said 
here is what our research, not what your failures are, because we understand they've admitted that they, they want to make it better. Mr. Liggins, I know they're working with you and others to try to make it better. But what have you done to actually say, here's your number, here's reality? I'm seeing blank faces. Have any of you or collectively done anything so that you can come back and say, here is the proof that our number of listeners is different? I'm not trying to be hard. I, no, I think this is a fine. softball. Uh, as, as I indicated, I, uh, our company, Intercity Broadcasting, and we have two markets that we knew were going to be impacted by uh, uh, Arbitron because our other two markets, Jackson, Mississippi, and Columbia, South Carolina, are in the 83 and 120 are not likely in any in our lifetimes to probably get PPM measurement. Uh, we have worked very closely with Arbitron to understand the underlying um, um, methodology here and why the results were where they were. And we have just seen consistently the challenges that are there. Arbitron offered to, for example, to work with our company and work with other minority broadcasters who they also, in looking at the numbers, just looking at the numbers, realized that we were uh, uh, disproportionately impacted by this methodology even before they rolled it out. Uh, there were offers that they made, uh, you know, what about if we do some type of an engagement um, metric or engagement study, which sort of a, tries to address this issue of loyalty that seems to have been lost uh, in PPM at a cost to the broadcasters, who, quite honestly, we were being asked to pay 65 percent more with this methodology uh, with less results. Uh, that was something that at that point it was premature because we could not get a representative uh, sample. We reached out to other broadcasters to ask them to look at the results of their, um, their marketplace and what was going on. Let us try to understand, for example, what is the story of the African-American consumer and African-American radio stations in this new PPM world? Uh, we, there was no story to tell, unfortunately, without understanding are we talking about a representative panel, which in 2009 we've still not been able to get through. So as a, as a broadcaster, uh, we have reached out, we reached out with uh, the members of the PPM coalition who, as they started to roll this out in uh, pre-currency in New York City, suddenly got to understand now, what we have been and seeing I, and in some markets. And I apologize, markets. Mr. Warfield, but my question is more narrow than that. Uh, you know, we can't, we can't deal with the difference between loyalty, et cetera, et cetera, in some way from here, and neither can Arbitron. What they can do, and what I hope that we're helpful here today on the dais, because we are on a bipartisan basis very concerned, is if, if in fact your real effective numbers should be weighted in some way to where an advertiser, and I used to be an advertiser, can look and say, wait a second here, the comparative value of being on one of your stations or one of any of your stations is an eight, not a six, and I'm looking at a rate and I'm assuming I'm going to pay so much per million, is there, you can, you can probably make a lot of arguments about your listeners being better than that guy's listeners, that's what I was leading to with Mr. Liggins, but from our standpoint, if the number, the effective number, because of undercount, uh, who's willing to carry PPM, any of that, if it's off, what were you asking yourselves to do, or Arbitron, who has stayed here and really, I believe, wants to get the right number, regardless of what, everything that's being said at times, what have you done to say, okay, here's how we could analytically come up with a rate, and we would accept that adjusted rate, in other words, the scored rate is here, the skew is this. It doesn't seem like it'd be that hard. I, was, I did direct marketing at one time. We tagged 800 numbers so that every single uh, ad, if it went out on a different station, had a different 800 number. People used the 800 line. We, we verified what our return on investment was. That allowed us to take and know, as I said in my opening remarks, that BET, and I didn't say in my opening remarks, the Tune Network outperformed on a per dollar of advertising dollar many of the other competitors in our buy. We did that because we wanted to know. Now, that's an advertiser. You're the people who want to sell me in my old profession. What are you doing to work with our Arbitron or asking us to ask them to do to get that number right so the number doesn't have to be direct market checked by somebody like me, but in fact, you and the rating agency, if you will, can can come out with an accurate ratings agency. This is no different than we asked Standard & Poor's, by the way, when they had them in here and we wanted to know why junk was being rated AAA. We, we, we are just as concerned here. Please. Let, let me see if I could answer that in, in, a, in a very analytical way. 
it would be nice if we could afford to find another service to come in and give us what we would consider more accurate ratings. But at this point in time, with the exorbitant amount of money that we have to pay on our current contracts to Arbitron and the current economic conditions of our radio stations, we cannot afford to do so. So we rely on pushing as much as we can, as many buttons as we can in front of us, including the MRC, including meetings with, with Arbitron, to get that because we can't afford an alternate service to come in and give us that. We can't. It's as simple as that. Had we been, had, have we, if, if we get some leverage on our contract, had we not signed such onerous contracts that don't allow us to do that, we might be able to do so. We might be able to get uh, someone that can step up to uh, a monopoly and say, here's a different form of, of reading this marketplace, and here you have an, uh, an ability and an opportunity to go and seek where your, where your ratings really are. Mr. Liggins? Yeah, I, yeah I, and I think you know, Arbitron's put together a committee to work on this, but some metric that isolated sort of passive uh, uh, exposure to what was really active listening would actually help minority targeted formats. One of the things that's driven, the reason these minority radio stations, including our targeted radio stations, had such high ratings in the diary is because the, the diary keeper would say, I listened to WKYS and just draw a line, said I listened all day. Well, actually minorities do listen to radio longer. They're more engaged. They take it more seriously. If you were to able to isol isolate that electronically somehow, then you could show a different value. Actually what you would do is you would discredit the audience of the easy listening station that, and this happens in PPM, the easy listening station could be number two with teens, 12 to 17 playing beautiful music and we know that's not the case but if diary excuse me a meters just happen to be in an environment carried by a teenager where they're exposed then that's what you get um, I think that they're working on that I know we're pushing for that that would be extraordinarily helpful in um, leading back to your other question and presenting value can I also say one more thing because because I think there's something that hasn't been said here that I think needs to be said even if the playing field were right, even if it's PPM or diaries, okay? Because I can speak about diaries, and I can tell you when the, the playing field was right in the New York area, I worked for Infinity Broadcasting that had Howard Stern in the morning. I was a director of sales before I came to SBS. Howard left that radio station at the tail end of 2005. All of 2006 in the New York area, the number one Morning Show was a Spanish language radio station that was owned and operated by us. Now ask me, did we get the same rates? And I can tell you emphatically, not even a quarter of the same rates that that radio station, my ex radio station had. So our audiences are already discounted. Our audiences are already not seen with the same quality of the same rating of the same audiences in, in other radio stations, general market radio stations add insult to injury and put us at 50 or 60 or 75 percent less in rating, and what do you get? Well, Mr. Chairman, as we close, I, uh, I found both panels very informative. I intend on writing a letter to Mr. Skarzynski and to Ar Arbitron asking them to, to get, come back to us and tell us what they could do to do some of this analytical uh, analysis without additional burden on our broadcasters, particularly minority broadcasters. I also, for one, would like to see those innovations, and uh, I would like to see as much information as the committee can request and Arbitron can give us of side-by-side -side comparisons when a diary was being filled out and someone was carrying uh, the <clears throat> PPM device so that we could have a, a closure to all of the questions that I think were developed here today on electronic versus diary, and hopefully uh, we can be constructive for the minority-owned stations uh, and, and, to be honest, for all of the, the rating stations, because if you get it right, it, we get it right for everyone. And Mr. Chairman, I want to thank you for holding a, an important, uh, a long overdue hearing and uh, for putting the time and effort into this, and I yield back. Thank you very much. And let me just, before we, we close out my closing statement, uh, Mr. Ligon, uh, you said that Radio One was able to regain 
its market share by changing programming to fit P the PPM world. What do you mean by that? I, I, I tried not to ask that. I was trying to yeah, see if yeah, I could no, figure it out on my that's, own. That, that, that's fair. Um, uh, one example is that um, uh, during the diary method, because diaries done in quarter hours, um, programmers thought that the best way to get the highest ratings would be to stack all of your commercials all at once and run 10 of them at the same time with very long what you call stop sets so you could sweep music for 40 minutes so you're kind of running you know one 20 minute block that's 80 percent commercials and then you got a 40 minute block that's commercial free well the fact of the matter is we found that that's the it does the exact opposite in ppm you're better off having um, uh, uh, more stop sets with actually fewer commercials in them uh, one of the things that you're also seeing uh, seeing in ppm is that the talk show hosts the Hannity's the the rush Limbaugh's um, I'm sure the Democrats would be happy to hear this actually have less audience than <laughs> they're still loud and noisy and they may have make a big impact but the fact of the matter is their audiences in PPM have dropped dramatically um, and I'm sure that their ad revenues um, are, are, are following as well so what does that say it says that talk no matter how big a personality you are um, uh, if it's not absolutely entertaining is a death nail and so you have to be very careful about what your air personalities are saying some personalities are better than others um, it also PPM will show you that people actually do listen to football games on the radio and audiences spike. Um, you can uh, tell which bits work. I don't know how many of you listen to the Tom Joyner morning show, but you can actually go through Tom Joyner's hour and figure out whether Huggy Lowdown or the little known black history fact or um, uh, the Black America Web News, which one of those are draws and which one of them uh, are, are, which one of those are turnoffs. And then you adjust your programming dramatically. In fact, Tom has, actually reformatted almost his entire show over the last two years because um, of information we found out from PPM. All right, thank you. Uh, yes, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, one thing I'd like to say about that is, as Alfred said, I mean, many of us used the, uh, the data. I mean, on the one hand, the Arbitron data is the only data that we have available to use. So we do have to use that data. We do pay for that service. On the other hand, as uh, Mr. Ligon just indicated, you know, we do, we are making those types of uh, changes on air, whether we like that or not. Unfortunately, as he indicated, you're taking resources away from the community. In many cases, you're taking programs that were previously very uh, successful and you're taking them off the air. But it still does not cover the reality here that in this PPM world, that the formats that have taken the greatest hit, the greatest decline in ratings consistently, market after market, has been Spanish and urban radio station formats. It was stated this morning that these formats still perform well. They do, at a much larger decline in their currency, average quarter hour, than any other formats that have been affected by this methodology. Can I say just one last thing? Um, I find it really interesting that in this day and age, when you pick up a newspaper and you find out that the exploding segments of our, uh, of our society happen to be Hispanic and new arrival Hispanic, that Hispanic listening across the board is down dramatically. These people are not coming in from Dubuque or Montana. These people are coming in from countries that only speak Spanish. And they're arriving here with no English skills whatsoever. So I know that, that our audience should be increasing in numbers that are great, and PPM shows it to be just the opposite. That can't be. Logic tells me that that's not right. So I, 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 I can't accept that. There's, there has to be a disconnect someplace. With the new census, there should be a rebalancing of the populations, which will flow through to Arbitron's database, and hopefully that will help black and Hispanic um, formatted stations. In Houston, Texas, because of Katrina, we think the black population's probably gone from 16.5% to 20%, and we're hopeful that that's what the census will show, and that we'll benefit from that, and hopefully you I guys will too. I agree. However, the issue at hand is it's currently, the audience is currently not represented for the size that those segments represent today, and the census isn't going to come out for another two years before we actually get the data. So we are way behind the eight ball, and from an advertiser point of view, if it's not working, it's very difficult to get an advertiser to come back into the marketplace. If you can't prove success 
today to an advertiser and return a, re and a return on investment today, they're not going to be back tomorrow. And that's the problem that we face. We've got radio stations that we know have historically performed very well in the marketplace. They don't have the numbers. Without the numbers, we can't justify being them on a buy. Without them being on a buy, we have ineffective plans in market. And it's very difficult to convince advertisers today to spend money in minority audiences. And when you finally make that effort and get them to spend the money and they don't see the results, it's, they're not coming back. And as far as the new arrivals, how, how successful could you possibly be trying to convince them to wear some sort of low jack device on them, okay, when they come from con countries that they don't trust their own government? And you think how successful you're going to be to get people to do that. So maybe your panels or your samples are going to represent more English-dominant Hispanics than Spanish-dominant Hispanics, and that might be a problem for all Hispanic radio stations because that's who we serve. Thank you very much. Let me thank uh, both panel witnesses, and of course, I want to thank the ranking member and all the members who attended uh, this hearing today. And before we adjourn, I must say that today's hearing has demonstrated the ineffective process currently in place to ensure the accuracy in media rating services. I remain gravely concerned about the future of minority-owned and targeted radio stations if Arbitron uh, does not act quickly to correct these problems. Minorities have battled over the past 30 years to obtain just 2% of the radio stations they now have, 2%. And we are on the brink of losing much of that progress. The Congress should not allow this to happen. The MRC was created to ensure media ratings are fair and accurate. However, Arbitron seems to take the MRC's code of conduct as a mere suggestion. They feel free to ignore MRC's recommendations and just move on. This approach must change. I'm prepared to introduce legislation which protects both the consumer and all radio and television competitors if necessary. I hope I don't have to do that. I hope that we can work things out. The ranking member suggested that we have some further discussions and dialogue and to see in terms of uh, how we might be able to work together to uh, resolve some of these issues and I hope we can do that. Uh, however, I urge all the participa participants involved in this issue, including the MRC and the FCC, to work during the next month to reach a solution to this problem. The very survival of small and minority radio is at stake. I want to see a plan of action and a realistic timetable, as the ranking member also suggested, develop over the next 30 days to correct this unsustainable situation. After that point, I will look to see if sufficient progress has been made or whether the Congress will need to step in. We don't want to step in, and I hope we don't have to step in, but I want you to know I am prepared to do whatever it takes to get an acceptable resolution to this problem. Again, let me thank all of the witnesses. I look forward to working with you because I really feel that we can do better. And I'm always for fairness. And I think that what we see and hear here is not fairness. Thank you so much for coming. And the committee is now Thank adjourned. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Yes, ma'am. So, the Republicans.